Hello everyone, this is Anna Udranga Kuramia from Kisembo Academy helping you manifest academic excellence and in today's video we will be exploring the following. The cello tape roll so I'm going to roll it from here this is part A and that's part B this cello tape roll it rolls in a straight line from part A to part B now if this cello tape roll is to roll from a part A to part B in a straight line and it is not interrupted it means it will have covered a certain distance in a certain time frame now let's assume that the distance between A and B is a hundred kilometers and this cello tape when it was rotating running from A to B it did cover this a hundred kilometers in a certain time frame so if we wanted to find the speed by which this cello tape roll was able to move from this point down to this point for us to be able to find that speed means that we're going to get the total distance covered from A to B and we divide that by the total time taken for the cello tape roll to move from A to B and in that case it means that that to get the distance covered means that it's going to be a hundred kilometers which is the distance covered divide that by the two hours it took we are now assuming that it took two hours to move from A to B so for us to be able to get the the, the answer here definitely is 50 kilometers and it is going to be 50 kilometers per hour that is the speed now 50 kilometers per hour means that if this cello tape roll continued to travel even beyond the point b and it continues moving in a straight line without interruption it means that for every one hour it will be covering 50 kilometers that is what we mean by 50 kilometers per hour that for every one hour it will be covering 50 kilometers and this is definitely what we call constant or uniform speed just like we've seen before, the formula for finding constant or uniform sp speed is simply b going to be equal to the distance covered, divide that by the time. So we get a kind of uh, formula that constant speed is going to be equal to distance over time. And if you are to make this a, a, a flat equation, meaning we multiply time on both sides to make it a flat equation to eliminate this fraction, it's going to become distance traveled is going to be equal to speed times time so in most of our workings where we are going to get we are we will be dealing with motion in a straight line it is very important that we put this commit this to memory that distance traveled is going to be equal to speed times time but you realize that speed shares the same units with velocity for example if you look at it here we know that our velocity is the measure of speed in a specified direction so this brings us to the difference between these two speed is a scalar quantity velocity is a vector quantity we all know that when we, we are talking about scalar quantities scalar quantities are simply physical quantities that only have magnitude and these ones include things like mass density area and then vector quantities are qu physical quantities which have both magnitude and direction and here we are talking about things like velocity we are talking about things like acceleration displacement and so forth so speed and velocity have the same units only that one is a scalar quantity the other is a vector quantity so when we are talking about speed and velocity the units will always be the same We'll head straight into a few examples. Find the distance traveled in 5 hours by body moving at a constant speed of 30 km per hour. So to summarize our question, we, uh, we have our time there being 5 hours. And we are talking about a body moving at a constant speed of 30 km per hour. So it means that the speed, which I'll call it V, is going to be equal to 30 km per hour. So they're asking us to find the distance. Distance, which we shall denote by S, is going to be equal to speed, which is V times time. And now our value of V is 30 kilometers, so it's 30 kilometers per hour. Multiply that by the time taken, which is 5. And definitely here, our, this is 5 hours. So it means that 30 times 5 is 
150. So our distance is 150. And of course, this hour and that hour cancel you mean with kilometers, so it's kilometers. So our distance traveled there is 150 kilometers. A body traveling at a constant speed covers a distance of 4 kilometers. In 3 minutes, find the speed of the body. So we know that the body is traveling at a constant speed. So the constant speed V. The constant speed is not given, you're supposed to find it. Covers a distance of 4 kilometers. So the distance S is 4 kilometers in a time frame of 3 minutes. So the time given here is 3 minutes. And so here we need to find the speed of the body. So definitely we know that the general formula is that the distance is going to be equal to speed times time. We know that the distance is 4 kilometers is going to be equal to the speed which is not given which you are looking for times the time which is 3 minutes. Now for us to find the, this, we are supposed to make sure that our units are harmonizing. We are having our distance here in kilometers and our time here in minutes. It means that our speed will be in terms of kilometers per minute. Now we need to convert these minutes to hours so that the speed we are able to get is in kilometers per hour, not in kilometers per minute. So it means we first convert this minutes to hours. Converting that to hours means we are going to divide this by 60 minutes. So we make V the subject of the formula and find the value of V. So here we did, we are, when we make V the subject of the formula in this case, this 60 is multiplied on both sides and then we divide both sides also by 3. You end up with 4 kilometers here, this is in kilometers, and multiply that by 60, 60 is in of course, here 3 over 6, these minutes cancel and you mean with 3 over 60 hours because we are converting these 3 minutes to hours. So it means that here we are having kilometers and uh, we are dividing that by hours. One, this is 1 over 3 over 60 hours. So for us to have gotten these units meant that it is 4 times 20. What we are getting here is 80 kilometers, divide that by hour, that's why we call it kilometers per hour. And that is uh, the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. If the distance from the sun to the earth is that, find the how long it takes from the sun to reach the earth. So to find the speed, we know that distance, which is denoted by s, is going to be equal to speed times time. The speed of light is that, so it means that the speed of light is going to be 3 times 10 to the power 8 meters per second. Um, if the distance from the sun to the earth is that, so meaning that if the distance s from the sun to the earth is 1.5 times 10 to the power 8 kilometers, find how long it takes, so they're asking for the time, how long does it take? for the light to move from the sun to reach the earth. So for us to be able to get our value of time, we're simply going to substitute in here. Now please take note of this, that here, our velocity is in meters per second, and our distance is in kilometers. So now this, this, these are kilometers, these are meters. We need to harmonize these units. They are either both kilometers, or both of them are meters but i think it's easier let, let, let's convert these kilometers to meters so that when we will re, when we are dividing the two these meters cancel out and our value of time is only remaining with per second so it means that converting this distance to kilometers we are going to multiply this by multiply this by a thousand Of course, when we multiply that by a thousand, it turns to meters. So when we continue with our working, therefore, it's going to become, we know that distance is going to be speed times time. And definitely our distance here is 1.5 times 10 to the power 8. But we are converting it, these kilometers to meters. So it becomes times 10 to the power 3 as well. It's going to be equal to speed. Our speed is 3 times 10 to the power 8 
meters per second multiply that by time so when we find make t the subject of the formula to find the value of time time therefore is going to become Now, of course, when all this is done, we get our value of t as 500. But remember that this top part here, which is 1.5 times 10 to the power 8, this was converted to meters. And uh, this downer part is in meters per second. So this is in meters. This is in meters per second. So meaning that this and the meters cancel out. And as far as our units are concerned, our value of time is in seconds. Because this is, is s to the power negative 1. When we shift this s to the numerator, it becomes 500 seconds. And of course, the question does not specify in what units we're supposed to state the time. So it means we can as well leave our time in seconds, and that is just fine. Let's say somebody is driving along the road, and as they are driving, they're going to start from this point. As they are driving their car, they're supposed to follow this path and reach their destination at this point. But as they are driving, we assume that as they start, you start at a lower speed like 20 kilometers per hour. Then you start accelerating and this speed will slowly start increasing to let's say 30 kilometers per hour, 40 kilometers per hour as you're moving along the straight track. But we all know that as you're moving from this point, when you are approaching the corner, you're supposed to reduce speed because you cannot go and you, you cannot negotiate this corner in this constant speed. So it means that as you're approaching the corner, you're going to reduce speed. So if, let's say, you are coming in at around 60 kilometers per hour, when you reach the corner, you're going to reduce to around 20 kilometers per hour. You will negotiate that corner. Then you will accelerate again. You increase speed. Then you reach the corner again. You're supposed to reduce speed so that you negotiate the corner. Then you will increase speed again to something like, let's say, 60 kilometers per hour. But you as approaching the corner, you reduce speed to, let's say, 20 kilometers per hour so that you're able to swerve that corner again and so forth until you're able to reach your destination. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that if a person is to move from this point to that point, it is impossible in real life for them to be able to use constant speed to move from here, unless the path is completely straight. But in most cases, as we are moving, you will encounter a bicycle along the way, you will encounter a motorist, you will encounter another road user along the road, and these people are going to definitely cause you to have to reduce your speed. So because of these speed variations, we are always unable to move, at the constant speed from where we started from to where we ended so because the, it is impossible when we are calculating we definitely have to find the average speed now or we'll call it the average velocity so the average speed will be we will mean that we're supposed to get the total distance covered and we also get the total time from this point to that point and when we divide the two we are able to get the average speed of this person and definitely, of course, the average speed simply signifies the constant speed this person would have traveled without having to reduce speed and all that. So for us to get the average speed, we simply are going to get the total distance and divide that by the total time. From the point the driver started driving to the point where they ended. It's the same thing. Average velocity is going to be the total displacement in a specified direction between uh, and divide that by the total time. Now I'll need, I, I have to explain. The, these two average speed and average velocity, they both have the same SI units. Average speed is in, the, it will have the same SI units as average velocity. It's all in meters per second or kilometers per hour. Now, what's the difference between average speed and average velocity? Why do these two have diff the same? Why, why do they have the same SI units, but if you look at them, they are having different formulas. Now, let me explain some theory here. When we are talking about average speed, speed and velocity, though they have the same SI units, they are different because one is a vector quantity, the other is a scalar quantity. Now, just to take us back to our theory, a vector quantity is a physical quantity that has both magnitude and direction. And a scalar quantity 
is a quantity that only has magnitude and does not have direction. Now, in this case, velocity is a vector quantity because it has both the magnitude and the direction, but speed is only a scalar quantity because it only has magnitude and no direction. Now, of course, other types of other examples of vector quantities, we have acceleration, we have displacement. Then for speed, of course, other types of, uh, for other examples of scalar quantities, we we have density, we have pressure, we have mass, and so on. We'll look more into those details when we are dealing with vector and scalar quantities in the physics videos. So, because this is a, a scalar quantity, speed, so we are going to, it will be total distance divided that by total time. Again, distance and displacement have the same SI units. They are both, can be measured in meters, they but distance, by definition, is simply the it's simply the space between two points, and then the displacement is simply the distance between two points in a specified direction. With distance, distance is concerned more on the magnitude. We will talk about distance to be things like 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers. But those 10, 20, 30 kilometers, their direction is not defined. This distance becomes displacement when we define the direction of the distance. So, for example, if we talk about things like 10 kilometers in the north direction, now that becomes displacement because it is having both magnitude and direction. If we, have, we talk about things like, let's say, uh, we are moving 100 kilometers south. So, 100 kilometers south becomes the displacement because it has both magnitude and direction. Then so, so basically it's total distance over total time, also total displacement over total time. It's more of the same, it's just the theory that makes these two stand out to be kind of different. So we'll do an example here to illustrate this. PQR are points along a straight line in that order, where PQ is 40 kilometers and QR is 90 kilometers. A man travels from P to Q and from Q to R at 10 kilometers per hour and 15 kilometers per hour respectively calculate the time taken between p and q now when we say kph we shall be meaning kilometers per hour so now to do this example we are going to go ahead and do roman one the time taken between p and q now before we calculate for the time taken between p and q we need to summarize the question in a diagrammatic way we are talking this is a, these are p q and r as points along a straight line so we are going to illustrate those in the diagram so we have p Oh, P, Q, and R. Now they're telling us that PQR are points along a straight line where PQ is 40 kilometers. So from P to Q, they are 40 kilometers. And then to Q to R is 90 kilometers. And also, as this man is traveling from P to Q and then from Q to R, he travels at 10 kilometers per hour. This 10 kilometers per hour is the speed he uses to travel from P to Q. So meaning from P to Q is 10 kilometers per hour. And then from Q to R, and from Q to R, he's going to move at 15 kilometers per hour. So these 15 kilometers per hour are traveled from Q to R. Roman 1, they're asking us to find the time taken between P and Q. Now, the time taken, we know that distance is going to be equal to speed. Distance is equal to speed times time. So now, since they're asking us to find the time, we have the distance, which is 40 kilometers. We have the speed, which is 10 kilometers per hour. So to find the time taken for the object to move from P to Q, We'll make t the subject of the formula. Of course, distance we denote it by s is going to be speed, which is v times time. So to make t the subject of the formula becomes t is going to be s over v, which is going to be equal to our distance between p and q is 40 kilometers. So it's going to be 40 kilometers. Divide that by the speed, which is 10 kilometers per hour. So which is divide that by 10 kilometers per hour. Of course, the kilometers will cancel, those that zero will go with that. You will remain with your answer as four, this is hour, per hour, 
the hour comes up, it becomes four hours. So it means that the time taken to move from P to Q is four hours. So Roman 2, they're asking us to find the time taken between Q and R. That's the second part of the motion. We are going to do the same. The time taken between Q and R, still we are going to use this. T is equal to S over V and we find the time. So T is going to be equal to S over V. The distance between Q and R is 90 kilometers. Divide that by the speed between that, which is 15 kilometers per hour. The kilometers will go by 15 once. By 15, we have 6. So the time taken between Q, P, uh, Q and R is actually 6 hours. Roman 3, they're asking us to find the average speed between P and Q. Now you realize... You realize that as this body was moving from P to R, it was moving at various speeds. When it moved between P and Q, it was moving at 10 km per hour. Then from Q, it increased its speed to 15 km per hour. So it means that for us to find the average speed of this, means that we are going to find the total distance covered, which for PQ, divide that by the total time. That's going to be total distance, divide that by total time. So to find the total distance is adding up the two distances. We know that from P to Q is 40 kilometers and then from Q to R is 90 kilometers. So it's going to be 40 plus 90. All these distances in kilometers, divide that by the total time. Now, from our earlier calculations, we know that the total time taken from P to Q, we got 4 hours plus the 6 hours. The six hours is the total time from that was taken from Q to R. We calculated that earlier. So our answer here is going to be 130 kilometers. Divide that by 10 hours. And so definitely our answer here is going to be 13 kilometers per hour. Kilometers per hour. Now this you can also write it as 13 kilometers per hour or you write it as 13 kilometers per hour either way it's correct still another example to help us illustrate the difference between average speed and average velocity remember we said that speed is a scalar quantity with only magnitude velocity has got both magnitude and direction now we have a question here that says that a man walks 400 meters due east in 190 seconds and 100 meters due west in 50 seconds calculate a his average speed and b his average velocity so this is how we are going to do this let's try and summarize this question using a diagram illustrating this diagram a man walks 400 meters due east so as he's walking, let's say this is the spot he starts. When he is walking, he's moving due east. And the question says that he's going to move 400 meters in the east. And then when he reaches that point after 400 meters, then in that he does this in 190 seconds. So meaning it's 400 meters are done so in 190 seconds. That's the time it takes. And then... He's going to move 100 meters due west in 50 seconds. So he moves 100 meters west. So we will move other 100 meters west in how after in 50 seconds. So he'll move that for in 100. So he will end up somewhere there. He started from here. He moved and then came back. And it stopped there so this kind of illustration this kind of uh, question is trying to demonstrate to us the magnitude of the distance which is 400 meters and it's going ahead to tell us the direction in which it moved so it is describing both the magnitude and direction non so if you are to find it, its average speed remember when we are coming to average speed we only concerned with magnitude it's going to be the distance covered divide that by the time taken but when it comes to average velocity, we are going to concern ourselves with the displacement. So let's go ahead and start working. Average speed. Total distance covered here. The guy starts 
from here. He moved 400 meters that way, plus 100 meters. So the total distance covered is going to be 400 meters. Add that to 100 meters. And divide that by the total time when he was moving the 400 meters, he moved for 190 seconds. And also when he came back, he moved only for 50 seconds. So the total is going to be 500 meters. Divide that by the total time taken. The total time taken is definitely going to be 2. So the time taken, the average speed is going to be 2, 1 meters per second. Meters per second. So now let's look at the average velocity. How, what is this average velocity? Again, average velocity formula is? Now remember here, when it comes to average velocity, we are going to be dealing with displacement, not distance. Remember that with distance, we were dealing with just the magnitude. The guy moved 400 meters in that direction, then came back. So the total distance moved is simply 400 plus 100. We do not mind about the direction, as we just talk about the distance the guy moves. But when it comes to displacement, even by definition, displacement is the uh, distance moved in a specified direction. So meaning that if this guy started moving from this point, and this is where he ended, the distance he moved is 500 meters, but his displacement is not 500 meters. We say that displacement is the distance moved in a specified direction. So meaning that if he started from this point and he ended here, it means that the distance he has moved in this direction is simply going to be, this is where he started from, this point, and this is where he ended. So if from here to here is 400, then from here to here is 100, it means that the remaining here is going to be 400 minus 100, which shall remain 300. So it means that much as this guy moved from this point to that point and the distance he covered to move from here to here, the distance covered is 500 meters. His displacement is 300 because the specific distance covered in the specified direction from the point he started to the point he ended is 300 meters. Again, let's get the difference. Distance is a scalar quantity. Velocity is a vector quantity, and with velocity, we are talking about the magnitude and direction. With scalar, we are only talking about the magnitude. And so that's the case with distance. Distance is just the, the how much you move. It's only distance concerns itself only with the magnitude. So in this case, the distance moved to come from here to here is simply 400 plus 100, which is 500 meters but when it comes to displacement displacement by definition is the distance covered in a specified direction so meaning that the displacement of this guy from this point to that point is 300 and it is in that direction so it means that in this case the displacement is going to be equal to for um of course 400 minus 100 remain with 300 so we shall just put it right there that it's going to be 300 meters and it's in what direction? It is in the in the eastern direction. So it's 300 meters in the eastern direction. By the time taken. Now, of course, the time taken to make that displacement to move from here to there is seems still going to be the same. It's 240 seconds. I mean, right here, I moved from here. It's 190 plus that time, which is 50, making it 240 seconds. So it means that our time, our average velocity is going to be one, one over four meters per second and it is in the eastern direction so our average velocity is simply that one and a quarter meters per second in the eastern direction let's try and work out this example still we're trying to illustrate how average velocity and average speed differ a body moves due north from a 10 kilometers to B. So we'll summarize this question right away with a diagram. We are having a body here. It's moving due north from A. So if this is point A, this body is moving up due north, point A. 
10 kilometers to point B. So it's traveling a distance of 10 kilometers to a point up here we are calling point B for four hours. So the time taken here is four hours. From B, it then moves due south to C at a, a distance that is 30 kilometers in one hour. So as it comes on top up to B, it's going to move back down to another point C and it is moving from this point B, it's moving down to C which is 30 kilometers in one hour. So it's going to move 30 kilometers in one hour up to point C. Now this is 30 kilometers, this is 10 kilometers, this is definitely lower than that. This is longer. So we are supposed to ask to find the average speed. So again, to find average speed, it's going to be total distance, divide that by total time. So the total distance covered here, since it's, we are dealing with distance, when we are trying to find average speed, we deal with total distance. Distance, we are only going to con concern ourselves with the magnitude. So the distance traveled from A up to C, it first moves upward 10 kilometers, then downwards 30 kilometers. So the total distance covered is 10 kilometers plus 30 kilometers. It's going to be 10 plus 30. All this is in kilometers. Divide that by the total time. Now the total time covered is going to be upward it moves four hours then downwards is one hour so it's four plus one which is five hours and that's going to be 40 divide that by five and of course this is in kilometers per hour and that will be equal to eight kilometers per hour so the average speed is 8 km per hour. Now we're going to look at the average velocity. The average velocity is going to be the total. So we're going to find the total displacement. Now if you look at this thing, it is going to move upwards. It, it moved 10 km northwards, then 30 km downwards. So if we are to restructure this, it is 10 km up, then 30 km down in the opposite direction. So it means that what is the displacement from the point it started to see. If we are to re redraw this here to make the displacement issue clearer. This started from A. This is point A. It moves up a distance of 10 kilometers. Then when it reaches to point B, it's supposed to, it moves down again another 30 kilometers down to point C. So it means that the total distance moved from A to C, the displacement is this, the specific distance covered in this specified direction. So for me to move from A to C means that it's going to be this 30 kilometers minus that 10 to get the remainder. So 30 minus 10 is definitely 20 kilometers all. So to calculate the total displacement, it's going to be 10 kilometers upwards. So we are going to call it 10 minus because this 30 kilometers is in the opposite direction of 10 so it's going to be minus 30 uh, and, and, and that definitely the displacement is due south divide that by, by the total time taken now of course the total time taken is the same as before which is 5 hours yeah. now of course 30 minus 10 or 10 minus 30 here it's going to be 20 now, of course, 10 minus 30 here is negative 20. Now, that negative is represented by the south because it is 20 southward. So that negative here is due south. So the due south is what is represented by the negative there. Divide that by 5 hours. And of course, 20 divided by 5 is 4 kilometers per hour due south and definitely this is the average velocity of the body now you could go ahead and try out that number on your screen a particle moves due south a distance of 80 kilometers for two hours from there it moves northwards a distance of 120 kilometers for three hours you could go out and try out that number 
The average speed I expect you to get is 40 kilometers per hour and the average velocity I expect you to get is 8 kilometers in the north direction. 8 kilometers per hour in the north direction. Now ABC are three points lying in order on a straight line with these with those dimensions. So we're going to let's summarize this question. ABC. We have A, we have B right there, we have C. Now ABC are simply three points lying in that order on a straight line with AB giving us 60 meters. So we have down here 60 meters. Then AC is 80 meters. So we move from here to right to there is 80 meters. So if this is 60 and from A to C is 80, so to get BC is simply going to be 80 minus 60 to get the remainder of this portion BC, which is, so that 60 plus 20 is 80 meters. So they're telling us that AB is 60 meters and AC is 80 meters. A body moves from A to B at an average speed of 10 meters per second. So the body moving from here to here, this is the distance. We call it S and the S there. So it means that the average speed here is going to be 10 meters per second to move from A to B. Then this same body they are talking about, then this same body moves from B to C in a time of 4 seconds. So it moves from B to C in a time of 4 seconds. And then it returns to B. So it means after moving to C, it comes back and returns. It returns to point B. And then it returns to B. The average speed for the whole journey is 5 meters per second. So it means that average speed to move from A, B to C, then back to B is 5 meters per second. So now that we finished summarizing our question, let's look at what they want us to find here. Part A, the question requires us to find the average speed of the body in the second stage of the motion B to C. Of course, now the second stage of the motion here is B to C is right here. And the question is requiring us to find the average speed. So right here, they want the average speed. Then part B wants us to find the average speed of the body moving from A to C. So the average speed moving from A to C. So meaning that the, we are also required to find the average speed. So the second part of the question wants us to find the average speed to moving from A to C. So we are supposed to also find that. Then also part C, the time taken for the third stage of the motion, that is from C to B. So from C to B. What is the time taken to move for that portion of motion? So the time taken to move from C to B is also required. So we'll mark that as well. Then part D, the average velocity for the complete motion. So this is definitely what we shall do at the very end, the average velocity of the complete motion. So now let's get started with part A. Part A is requiring us to find the average speed of the body in the second stage of the motion. Now this is the second stage of the motion. They want us to find the average speed. So we will go ahead and calculate it. Now we know that the average speed, the formula is going to be equal to the total distance divided by the total time. Now the second portion of the motion, B to C, the average speed we are supposed to find here is going to give us the total distance, which is 20 meters, divide that by the total time, which is 4 seconds. So in this case, this is going to become equal to 20 divide that by 4 it is 20 meters and these are 4 seconds so it means our answer is going to become 5 meters per second and that's our average speed for the second portion of the motion so we have answered part a now part b required us to find the average speed of the body moving from a to c so we're supposed to find this average speed moving from a to c to find that average speed it's going to be equal to total distance divided by total time. 
So now the total distance moved as this bed is moving from A to C. The total distance is definitely going to be 60 meters plus the 20 meters, which is the 80 meters that were given in the question. So it's going to become 80 meters divided that by the total time. Now the total time moved. We do not have the time. We have the time between B and C, but from A to B, we do not have the time covered. We only have the average speed and the distance. We do not have the time here. So it means that for us to get the total time of this whole distance, we need to first find the total time here. So it means we are going to do some sort of side work to get the total time here. To get the total time covered between A and B, we know still that distance is going to be equal to speed times time. Now the distance covered from A to B is 60, so it's going to be 60 is going to be equal to speed. The speed covered is 10 meters per second times the time. So when we make t our subject of the formula, t is going to become 60 over 10, which is going to be 6 seconds. So it means that the time taken to move from A to B, the time there is 6 seconds. Now that we have the time covered from A to B, then we have time covered from B to C. So now we can get the total time taken to move from A to C. So we can now continue here with our average speed of from A to C. Our average speed is definitely going to be total distance, which is that of our total time. The total time is 6 plus 4, which is 10 seconds. So it's going to be over 10 seconds. And definitely our answer there is going to be... So our average speed definitely there is... 8 meters per second. So we go ahead and answer part C. Part C required us to find the time taken for the third stage of the motion, that is from C to B. So as you're moving from point C to point B, what is the total time taken? Now we know that average speed is going to give us total distance divided by total time. And now the total distance as the this thing moves from A to B to C, then back to B. As we are moving from A to B to C, then back to B, the total distance covered is going to be 60 plus 20 meters, then plus 20 meters. So it's going to be 60 plus 20 meters plus another 20 meters. That's the total distance covered. Divide that by the total time. The total time from here to there, we got 6 seconds, so it's going to be 6 seconds. Add that to the total time moved from B to C is 4 seconds. So the total time moved from B to C is 4 seconds plus 4 seconds. Add that to the total time moved from C to B is not known. So the total time moved from B to C is not known and it is what they want. So we'll call it T. That is going to be give us the average speed. Now the average speed of the whole journey is 5 meters per second. So the rest is arithmetics. This is 100. Divide that by 10 plus t is equal to 5 meters per second. When we make t the subject of the formula, we shall end up with... So we get our value of t here as 10 seconds. So what does that mean? It means that the time taken to move back from c to b is 10 seconds. Then in part D, we are required to find the average velocity for the complete motion. To find the average velocity of the complete motion, average velocity of the complete motion, the formula will be total displacement total displacement divided that by total time. Now, of course, the total displacement According to our diagram, the total displacement, we see that this object, uh, the movement is from A to B to C in that direction, then it comes backwards. So it's going to be that in the positive direction minus the distance. Our displacement is moving from here up to there. That's our displacement. I hope we still remember that the difference. Distance is 60 plus 20 plus another 20. But now this is displacement. Displacement is the distance covered in a specified direction. So it means our displacement is just this, this distance from the point you started to where you ended. That's your displacement. So it means that according to this, our total displacement is going to be uh, from here to there, that is 60 meters. So it means our displacement is 60 meters in the right direction, or let's call it the eastern direction. 
60 meters due east, divide that by the total time taken. The total time taken is 6 seconds plus 4 seconds plus 10 seconds. That's going to give us 20 seconds. So it's going to be 60, divide that by 20. And definitely that is going to give us 3 meters per second due east. Today we are going to look at how we express the position vector using the IG notation. Now the position vector is simply a vector that shows the position of a particle relative to its origin. This is the origin, 0, 0. So if we're having a particle P at that point, it means that the position vector or the position of this particle P from the origin is means that you're going to move certain steps in the x direction and then certain steps in the y direction to be able to reach point p and in this case when we are using the ij notation the i in this case denotes for x how many steps you have to make in the x direction then the j starts stands for the y so these are the so meaning that if the this uh, was uh, let's say if the from o to a if this was let's say five units from here to there and then this okay this part where this was five and from here to here let's say it was uh, eight it would mean that the position vector of p first of all the coordinates of p will be from the origin it would be five comma and then when you go along the y direction it will be five comma eight and if it is five comma eight it simply means that uh, if we are to use the ij notation to represent this the position vector of p in this case which should be op so meaning that the position vector of op will be 5 in the x direction so the x direction is denoted by i then plus 8 it is positive 8 and that is in the j direction the j direction in this case will be in the x direction and so it means that the position vector of p which is op is 5i plus 8j and that is how we generally express position vectors using the ij notation now with this ij notation in general terms if we want to find the magnitude of this of this vector this is o to p so it means the magnitude simply means that we 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 look at it this way if this forms something called like a right angle triangle as you can all see right here it's so to get the magnitude of r we use pythagoras theorem now we know that pythagoras theorem for a right angle triangle is that the this line squared plus that line squared gives us this line squared and in this case we are having this side which is a denoted by a so it's going to be a squared plus that line which is b squared because from here to here it is b so which is b squared that's going to be c squared and in us the case c squared is r squared so when we make r the subject of the formula it's going to end up being under the square root of a squared plus b squared so now r the magnitude of r though the magnitude of this vector op is denoted by a squared plus b squared that is in general terms now when it comes to finding to find the direction of this vector the direction of this vector simply means that we, we are being tasked to find the angle between the vector and the horizontal and here we are simply going to use one of our trigonometrical identities to get the value of theta we can use the tangent of that angle we know that the tangent of that angle theta is going to be equal to the opposite and in this case the op this is the right angle triangle we're looking at so the opposite in this case is b so it's going to be b over adjacent the adjacent in this case it is a so when we make theta the subject of the formula theta is going to be the inverse of tang tan inverse of b over a so when we want we are faced with a vector like this in ij notation p of ai plus bj if we want to find the magnitude this is the general expression and if you want to find the direction 
it is that. And that is exactly how we state them, that the magnitude of is going to be this and the direction will be exactly like that. Now let's look at the velocity vector using the IJ notation. Now looking at this velocity vector, for example here we are having a particle still, let's say this is our particle here, and we are calling that particle P. Now we need to find the velocity of this particle. The velocity vector of this particle is given. That the velocity of this vector is ci plus dj. Still i is denoting the x direction and j denoting the y direction. Now this is the velocity vector of this. Now if you want to find the position vector of r after a certain time t, we do not know the time. Let's say this thing, originally it was at this point r. Now it starts moving at that velocity. So it means that if we want to denote the position vector of this value of p after a certain time t, it would mean that still we are going to first add the position vector of, of, of this value of p from the origin. Then after we get it and add on the distance it has traveled. This is the particle p. It is moving with a certain velocity. So meaning that if it is to move, it is going to move a certain distance. Let's call that distance. Let's call that distance s. So it means that if we want to find how long this particle p has moved at this velocity, we know that distance, distance is given by speed times time. So if I want to know the distance traveled by this particle p, I'm simply going to get the speed, which in this case the speed is the value of v, v times time. It's going to give us the, the distance. So, meaning that if I want to find the particle P, how much it has moved using this velocity, I'm simply going to find the velocity times time, and I'll get the distance moved. Now, since here we are dealing, our velocity is in terms of ci plus dj, it is a velocity vector. It means that if I want to find the, the vector, how much this particle P has moved, I'm simply going to get the velocity vector, multiply that by time. So meaning that after it has moved at that speed, if I want to know now how much, if I want to know its position vector after a certain time, t, it would mean that I have to add this distance it has moved plus its initial position vector. So this is going to bring us to this, that if I want to find the position vector of a particle after a certain time, t, the position vector will be given by The new position vector will be equal to the initial position vector of this particle plus the vector that is representing the time, how much it has moved. Let's illustrate this using an example. We have a particle, it has an initial position vector of this, and if the particle moves with a constant velocity of that, find the position vector of p after a certain time t. So now we want to find the new position vector after the thing has moved for some time. So we'll work it out this way. Initially, this particle had an initial position vector. Let's say this is the particle P. It had an initial position vector of 3i plus 2j plus 4k. And then it moves with a certain velocity. Now this is initial position vector of P. Of P. Then it is moving with a velocity of uh, 5i plus j minus 3k. So for me to be able to find its new position vector after it has moved would mean that they, it's going to be, let's denote it by r, the new position vector r after a certain time t is going to be given by the initial position vector, the place where it was initially, which was 3i plus 2j plus 4k. And then this is the position vector from the origin initially. Then plus, we are supposed to add that extra distance that it moved. So that we add the distance it moves with this velocity plus the distance it is from the origin for us to be able to get its new position vector from the origin. So it means that we are going to first add the distance from the origin plus the new distance it travels. 
the new distance it travels is going to be speed times time. The speed we are having here, or which is our velocity, is that one. So it means that it's going to be the speed times the time. And the time here we do not know because the question is telling us after a certain time. So it's going to be the time times the velocity it moves or the speed it moves, which is 5i plus j minus 3k. So this is the general. Now, of course, this continues. This becomes 3i plus 2j plus 4k plus now of course we open brackets here this is t times 5 which is 5ti plus t times j is tj minus 3 times it is minus 3 um, tj of course now we are going to group the i's alone the j's alone and then the k's alone and in this case it's going to become this is 3 plus 5t so this is going to be 3 plus 5t. These are the i's. Then plus, this is 2j and this is t. So it is 2 plus tj. So it is 2 plus t. And this is in j. Then also plus 4 minus 3. 4 minus 3. That is k. This is k. So it's 4 minus 3k. 4 minus 3t. This is, uh, this is in k. Uh, and definitely this is now the general expression in i notation for the position vector of this at any time t. We could as well express this in another way, in the column form. For example, if this, it, it's another way of writing it. If we said r of t, is going to be equal to 3 3i plus 2j plus 4k can be written in form of 3, 2, and 4. This is vectors in column form. Uh, plus, this is t outside into 5, 1, negative 3. 5, 1, negative 3. And still, this would lead us to um, 3 plus 5t, which 2 plus t, that, which this is 2 plus t, then 4 plus, um, plus negative 3t, so it is 4 minus 3t. And of course, this will still lead us to, uh, this is i, this is j, this is k. So still r, t is going to be got 3 plus 5t, i, this is in the i direction, this is j, j, this is the k. So it would still be 3 plus 5t i plus 2 plus t j plus 4 minus 3k. 3t k. So you still find yourself that you ending up with the same expression as here. So that is the position vector of P. This is the expression for the position vector of P after a certain time t. Now let's go ahead and do part B. Now part B is asking us to find the position vector of P after three seconds. So if it is after three seconds, it means that since we have the expression for the position vector after a certain time t, now here they are telling us that the time is three seconds. It means we are simply going to substitute for the value of t. We are going to put there three seconds and we get the position vector after three seconds. So in this case, the position vector after three seconds is going to be position vector after three seconds, which is r after three seconds is going to be equal to still from our earlier expression, it's going to be three plus five t. Now our value of t is 3, so 5 by 3, all this is i plus uh, 2 plus, that is 3, our value of t is 3, j plus 4 minus 3, so it is 4 minus 3, t, the value of t in this case is 3, that is k. So that's going to be 3 plus 15 
So the position vector after three, so the position vector after three is going to be this. Uh, this is all in meters. A particle has an initial position vector of that. If the particle moves with a constant velocity of that, that is 2i minus 4j meters per second, that is supposed to be meters per second, find the position vector after one second and after two seconds. So we get working. Now remember here that the formula is simple, that a particle, it has an initial position vector of 5. Now let's, let, let, let's assume that, uh, let the particle be y. So now if the particle is y, if we are to find the, the general expression for the position vector of a particle after a certain time t, we know that the position vector which we are denoting as r, position vector after a certain time t, will be given by the position vector of y plus time times the vector the, the velocity vector of that. This is how we denote it. O y is the position vector and here this is velocity vector times time, this is speed times time. Speed times time means that you are adding a certain distance because distance is equal to speed times time. So it means that you're adding this distance that this particle has traveled with us vector, you're adding this distance on top of the distance from the origin, which is the position vector, so that when you add those two, you're able to get the position vector after a certain time t. So in this case, the position vector OY, according to our question, it is 5i plus 3j. We can write this in column form. This is i, 5, 3 plus time times the velocity vector. Now the constant velocity that this thing is traveling is 2 and negative 4. Uh -huh. So this becomes 5, 3 uh, plus t. This is now the general expression plus t into 2, negative 4. That is the this is the position vector after a certain time t. t can be anything. But now this question is telling us that find the position vector after one second. So meaning to find this position vector after one second means that you're simply going to substitute the value of one here. Then part b after two seconds, it means you're going to substitute the value of two here and we shall be getting our respective answer. So in this case, to answer part a means that we are going to find, it's going to be r times after one second means the value of t is 1, r of 1 is going to be 5, 3, plus the value of t is 1 into 2, negative 4. Of course, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times negative 4 is negative 4, so this remains the way it is. It becomes 5, 3, plus 2, negative 4, like that. So we go ahead and add these vectors. When we add these vectors, it's going to become 5 plus 2, which is... 7 then 3 minus 4 which is giving us negative 1 now this is in the uh, the x direction this is in the y direction so finally the position vector the question wants to find the position vector remember so it means that the position vector which is r of of, of 1 is going to be 7 i minus neg minus 1 j minus j and this is in meters so this is the position vector of that particle after one second so now to find the position vector after two seconds we are still going to substitute the value of t we're just going to put there number two so meaning after two seconds meaning that when r is two seconds it's going to be equal to five three add that two uh two into two negative four this gives us five three plus 2 times 2 is 4, and then 2 times negative 4 is negative 8. Then you will end up with 5, 5 plus 4 is 9, so this is going to give us 9. Then 3 plus negative 8, this is the same as saying 3 minus 8, because this positive and negative is the negative that takes the day. So 3 plus negative 8 is going to simply give us negative 5. So when we do... So this becomes uh, our position vector after two seconds is going to become 9i. This is in the x direction, then the y direction is minus 5j. So here we have converted 
the, the vector from column form to IG notation. We will convert this to IG notation because the question, the vectors given in the question are in IG notation, so it means that our answers have to be in IG notation. We have another number here. A particle has an initial position vector of that. So now let's call that particle P. So if that's the particle, the particle is P, it means that the its position vector, a particle has an initial position vector of this. So it means that the initial position vector of P is going to be equal to uh, A, B, C, K. So I, I, I like writing these in column form. It's easier to calculate them when they're in column form. Then we shall give the final answer in IJ format. So this is going to be A, B, C. That's the vector, the position vector of P. OP. Then they're telling us that the, the, the particle moves with a constant velocity of this. So it means that the velocity vector it moves with is 3, 1, and 4 meters per second. And after 2 seconds, it has a position vector of that. So it means that after 2 seconds, this is its position vector. So meaning that its position vector after 2 seconds is going to be equal to 7, 1, and 4. Like that. So we're supposed to find the values of A, B, C and find how far the particle is from the origin after 2 seconds. So at first, our first task is to find the A, B, C, the, the, the values of A, B, and C. Now again, we know that the general expression for to find the position vector of a particle after any time t means that the position vector after a certain time t is going to give us first the position vector of this which is going to be op plus the added distance it travels from the position vector and of course the added distance it traveled is going to be speed times time which is going to be it's the velocity vector multiply that by the time and in this case r of t the position vector after any time t is going to be op our position vector here is a b c plus time times the velocity vector which is three one four so this is the general expression for our position vector after any time t but now the question wants us to find the values of a b c now, since we have that the position vector after 2 seconds is 7, 1, 4, so we are going to take advantage of this information to help us find the values of A, B, and C. So R of 2, it means that uh, when, the value of, 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 when the value of T is 2, when we put 2 here, it means that this whole expression will be equal to 7, 1, 4. So we know that since... So meaning that when our value of t is 2, the expression is that. So meaning that r of 2 is going to be 7, 1, 4. So we substitute here when r, when the value of t is 2, it means that the position vector is 7, 1, 4. So meaning that here, 7, 1, 4 is going to be equal to a, b, c plus t. Our value of t is 2 times 3, 1, 4. And of course now this is going to become 7, 1, 4 is going to give us A, B, C plus 2 times 3 is 6, 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 4 is 8. For us to be able to find A, B, C, we are going to make this the subject of the formula. So this comes that way. So this becomes 7, 1, 4 minus... 6, 2, 8 is going to give us A, B, C. So our value of A here is going to be 7 minus 6, which is 1. We have 1 minus 2, which is negative 1. Then we have 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. So from here, we shall conclude by saying that our value of A is actually 1. Our value of B is negative 1. Our value of C is negative 4 and that's how we get our values of a b and c so after finding the values of a b and c now we're being asked to find how far the particle is from
from the origin after two seconds. Now to find the, the, the they are actually asking us to find the magnitude of the vector because as far as the particle is from two seconds, according to the question they are telling us that after two seconds it has a position vector of this. So meaning that after two seconds the position vector of the particle is seven, one. So that's the position vector after two seconds. So it means that if we are to find the distance this particle is from the origin after two seconds, it means we are supposed to find the magnitude of this vector. So it means that the magnitude of vector is going to give us, we're going to simply find the square root of seven squared plus one squared plus four squared. That's going to give us that the square root seven squared is 49 plus 1 plus 16 and we shall end up with so meaning that this is going to give us 8.12 meters and so that's the deep position of the particle and this is how far the particle is from the origin after the seconds you can try out the number on the screen. A particle has an initial position vector of that meters and the particle moves with a constant velocity of this. Find the position vector of the particle after t. Then afterwards, the position vector of the particle after five seconds. Now for this kind of answer, for this kind of number, I expect that when you do part A, you will get an expression which when in such that when you put number five as the value of t, you should be able to get 19i minus 7j minus 16k as your final We are going to dive straight into how we derive the equations of motion. That is motion in a straight line. We have approximate, we have five equations of motion and we are going to... In this video, I'm going to show how we derive the equations of motion. But before we get into the derivations, I would like to take you through the overview of where we are going. To begin with, the parameters we are going to consider are displacement, which is, be, is going to be denoted by S. We have the initial velocity, which will be denoted by U. We will have the final velocity, which is denoted by V. Then we'll have the acceleration, denoted by A. And then the time, denoted, denoted by small t. Now, what are these equations that we are trying to derive? The equations of motion are basically five. We have the first equation of motion, which is V is equal to U plus AT. We have this one, we have that one for displacement. We have this one for V squared is equal to U squared plus 2AS, and then finally that one. But in all these five equations, you know that you notice that in each and every equation there is a certain parameter that is missing. If you look at these parameters that we considered at the beginning, the displacement, the initial velocity, the final velocity, the acceleration and the time, if you to examine each and every equation, there is a parameter missing, one parameter of all. If in a certain equation you find that all these four parameters are there and S is missing, then in another equation you find that U is missing and all the other parameters are there, or you'll find T missing and all the other are there and so on. And so it means that as we are deriving these equations, we have to put in mind in some of our substitutions that there are certain parameters that we will be deliberately leaving out for us to be able to attain the equation we're trying to derive. For example, if you look at the first equation of motion, it is S that is missing. There is no displacement here. But this displacement is in all the rest of these equations. If you look at this second equation, we have A missing. The acceleration is not represented, but acceleration is in all the others. In the third equation, you have having final velocity missing, but final velocity is represented in all the other three. Then likewise here, time in this equation is missing but it is represented in all the other equations. And finally, even in this final equation, you're having u missing, but this u is represented in all those other equations. So we'll get started with first coming from where acceleration comes from. Now acceleration by definition, from our theory, we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Now, if we are to use an illustration as in our screen diagram below, the write-up says that if an object is to move in a straight line from 5 meters squared and after 3 seconds its velocity is 11 meters squared, this is what has been illustrated here, that this object starts moving from 5 meters squared, so it means that 5 meters squared is its initial velocity u. Then it moves and after 3 seconds, so after traveling for 3 seconds, this is from 0, after 3 seconds its velocity is 11 meters 
per second. So it means that it moves and its final velocity here, which is V, is going to be 11 meters per second. Then it means that the object was accelerating. It accelerated from an initial velocity of 5 meters per second to a final velocity of 11. And it means that when we draw this graph of velocity against time, the velocity time graph, when we draw this graph, the gradient of this graph represents the acceleration. And now to find the gradient, of course, the formula for gradient is going to be change in y. So what is changing in y? The final velocity 11 to get this acceleration, the slope. Acceleration is going to be equal to the change in y, which is 11 minus 5. Divide that by the change in x. The change in x, of course, it's the final minus the initial, which is 3 minus 0, giving us 3. 11 minus 5 is 6. Divide that by 3. Now, this 11 minus 5, of course, is in meters per second. And this time is in seconds. So, 6 over 3 is going to give us 2. Now, 2 is in meters per second squared. Of course, this meters per second squared is coming from here. Meters per second divided by second gives us meters per second squared. So now this 2 meters per second has been gotten from the slope of this graph. And this is the acceleration. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Because as we can see here, we are having velocity being divided by time. So the rate of change of velocity is what has given us this acceleration. And so we are going to use this kind of analogy to derive our first equation of motion. Now looking at that, our first equation of motion, still we are going to consider a, an object which is moving from initial velocity u to final velocity v. And when you draw a velocity time graph, uh, this is velocity in meters per second, this is time in seconds. So to find that slope, we know that right here, the slope of this graph to get the acceleration the slope is going to be change in y. Now, of course, the change in y is the final minus initial, the final velocity v minus the initial velocity, which is u. Divide that by the change in x. The change in x, of course, it's the final time, which is t minus the initial time, which is zero. This is supposed to give us the slope, which is so happens to be the acceleration. So when we make uh, this a flat equation, this becomes v minus u over t is going to be equal to a. Multiply t on both sides. This goes with that. You remain with v minus u, giving us a t. When we make v the subject of the formula, v becomes, u goes the other side, u plus a t. Just here, v minus u over t is equal to a, and this step comes to that. This is how we arrive at this, which is that. Now that makes up our first equation of motion, V is equal to U plus A T. So now we are going to go on to the next equation of motion. Now still the next equation of motion, we are still going to use this very graph. From our theory, we know that the area under a velocity time graph represents the distance traveled by that particular particle. And in this case, if you look at this graph, if I'm to draw that right there, it is going to form what we call a trapezium. So now the trapezium, it means that if we are to find the area of this trapezium, this, the area of this trapezium is going to give us the distance traveled by this particle from that point, the distance traveled by this particle from initial velocity u to final velocity v. So the area of a trapezium If I were to change this graph like this, this is how the trapezium looks like. And so it means that as far as our trapezium is concerned, our value of A, uh, the height of the trapezium is going to be that one, this, and this will probably be our value of A, and this is our value of B. And now the area of a trapezium is given by, area of a trapezium is going to be a half H into A plus B. And from our trapezium earlier, I'll redraw it here. Now looking at our trapezium here, if I'm to put it upright, the way it should look like, 
this is going to be a value of h and our value of h is definitely coinciding with the length 0 to t so this is our value of t right there then here we are looking at it this way then here it is coinciding with u because from here to there the the length is u initial velocity so our value of a is corresponding to the value of u and then our value of b here is corresponding to our value of v which is v this is v this is u and this is our value of t and i have extrapolated this and i have put it there like that so it means from our area it's going to be a half h into a plus b which is going to be a half times t our value of h corresponds to the time into the initial velocity u plus the final velocity which is v and definitely when we rearrange this uh, this becomes u plus v over 2 and all this is times t which is that one so this makes up our second equation of motion from that graph if we are not to use the graph to find the second equation of motion we can relate it that we know that average velocity is going to be initial velocity plus final velocity divide that by two and also another formula for average velocity is displacement divide that by time so it means that we are going to equate this to that so that's how we end up with displacement over time is equal to average velocity which is u plus v over 2 since so uh, the displacement is denoted by s divide that by time is equal to u plus v over 2 then when we make s the subject of the formula we end up with s is equal to u plus v over 2 times t and this is just an alternative way or this is another way we can find our second equation of motion and so we'll go ahead and find derive our third equation of motion now our third equation of motion we are still going to consider this very graph this very graph but we are going to look at this graph we are still going to try and find the area under this graph but only that this time around the area under this graph instead of finding the, the area as a trapezium we are going to divide this area into two and so we are going to get the area of this triangle and we add that area to that rectangle and then when we add the two areas we are going to get an expression that is going to give us our next equation of motion the third equation of motion so here is how we are going to do it this we are going to get the area under this trap this graph but we are going to divide it like that so we have area of a and area of b and definitely of course here the area of this first portion our value of a is going to be a half this is a triangle and we know that the formula for defining the area of a triangle is a half times base times height so that is a half times base times height plus the area of the uh, rectangle which is length times width and of course in this case it's definitely going to turn out to be that our a which is the distance because our area under this graph is the distance so distance s is going to be a half times base now the base here is t because the distance is t times height now the height here is v minus u this is v minus u where is the v minus u coming from of course v minus u here is the distance from here to here is v the distance from here to here is u this is v this is u so to get this remaining distance which is corresponding to that it's going to be v minus the u to get that remaining distance that's how we come up with that v minus u plus now length times width this is a triangle a, a rectangle our value of length is that's our length which is t and our width which is u so that's how we come up with that step so from here it's going to become a half now this at has replaced that into this so it is a half times v minus u which is good actually this whole thing this whole thing is that this whole thing becomes at squared plus ut now how do, does this come about now we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity 
So we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity and by that we mean that acceleration is going to be equal to This is the definition of acceleration. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. Final velocity minus initial velocity over t. Now when we make this a flat equation and we multiply t on both sides, we shall end up with at going to be equal to v minus u. So you realize that this v minus u which is here is the same as at. So we get this v minus u and replace it with at. So it means that when we get from this step, let me write it here. When we come from this step which is a half t into v minus u plus u t the next step after this is going to become a half times t into v minus u now v minus u is the same as at so instead we shall write at right there plus u t so now at times t becomes a half a t times t is t squared plus u t so this is how this a half a t squared plus u t this is how it comes to be like this in the next step so now when we get to that we have formulated our third equation of motion in this case our third equation of motion is that one it shows that s is equal to u t plus a half a t squared that's our third equation of motion alternatively we can find the third equation of motion by substituting so for us to get our third equation of motion the fourth equation of motion and the fifth equation of motion those other three equations also are going to be derived using substitution so now the substitution is going to be entirely based on which parameter do we want to eliminate we eliminate that parameter by substituting the first two equations now the first two equations of motion we got well now these are the first two equations of motion we got we got this first equation of motion using the graph we got this first second equation of motion also using the graph when we got this first equation of motion we were basically depending on the theory that acceleration is equal to the rate of change of velocity from its definition from the definition of acceleration we were able to derive this equation and then for us to be able to get this second equation of motion we were able to get it by looking at the area under the graph so all these other three equations of motion shall be gotten by substituting these two so it means that if we want to get the value the third equation of motion we are simply going to eliminate v in this equation so we are going to get the value the expression for v which is this one and substitute it here to get this one if we are going to for us to get the fourth equation of motion it means we need to eliminate t if we are to eliminate t it means we are going to get this value of t here make t the subject of the formula in this equation come and substitute the value of t here so that we eliminate t in this expression and that's how we are going to get this expression likewise in the fifth equation of motion we are eliminating u so it means we're going to get u here get this equation the first equation make you the subject of the formula then get the expression for u in this equation substitute it here and then we'll be able to get the fifth equation of motion like that so you can do it any way you like but the main idea behind is that we are formulating these equations based on eliminating the parameters that you see right here so we'll go ahead dive straight into it so it means that for us to substitute for we, we to get the next third equation of motion we are going to get this equation of motion which is the second equation of motion we derived earlier and then we eliminate v when we eliminate v it means that we are going to eliminate v from our first equation our first equation of motion was v is equal to u plus at and our second equation we got was this one so we are going to get this value of v and substitute it right there when you substitute it right there u plus at is what we put here so it's going to be u plus v v which is equal to u plus at divide that by two times time and so from there we shall end up with u plus u is 2u and then plus 
80, which is 80. And of course, when you multiply this times time, it becomes 2ut, and then 80 times time becomes 80 squared. All this divide by 2. And then that's how we end up with our third equation of motion. So we're going to use the same idea. We're just going to play around with the first equation and the second equation to substitute them to make the, the, the fourth equation of motion. Again, our fourth equation of motion, we are going to get our first equation, which is V is equal to U plus AT. And when we make T the subject of the formula, it becomes T is equal to V minus U over A. So we are going to get this expression of T and substitute it in the second equation we derived earlier. So we are going to replace this value of T. So when we put this expression here, this value of t has been replaced here. So it's going to be v plus u over 2, then v minus u over that. So when this multiply that, that, that becomes u plus v into v minus u over 2 times a, which is 2a. From our mathematics, this is difference of two squares. So this is the same as v squared minus u squared. Of course, when you, add, when you open brackets here, you end up with this expression, divide that by 2a. That is going to be equal to s and when we make this a flat equation by multiplying times 2a on both sides here even here times 2a we shall end up with the expression of 2as is equal to v squared minus u squared when we make v squared the subject of the formula we shall end up with v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as which is our fourth equation of motion our fifth equation of motion we shall still use the same technique by playing around with the first two equations of motion still our first equation was v is equal to u plus 80 and then when we make u the subject of the formula, it's going to be v minus 80. So we substitute this u, value of u, in the second equation of motion, which is u, that u there. So when we get this u and substitute it right there, it's going to become the value of u. We put v minus 80 in its place, plus v, divide that by 2. Of course, when you open brackets with the t multiplied through vt minus 80 squared, plus tv, divide that by 2, you end up with you real tv plus tv is equal to 2tv minus 80 squared, which is that, minus 80 squared, divide that by 2. And definitely we will end up with our final expression. Our final expression is going to be s is equal to tv minus a half 80 squared, and that's our fifth equation of motion. So again, throughout, these were the parameters we were considering displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time. And each of those equations we were trying to derive, all these equations we derived, you saw that our first two equations were the ones that we derived from scratch. The first one we derived using the definition of acceleration. The second one we derived using the concept that the area under the graph is equivalent to the distance traveled by that particle. And then all these other three equations of motion were derived by substituting these two. We substitute these two in such a way that we eliminate V, we eliminate T, and we eliminate U in these substitutions of these two equations to be able to attain these other three equations. Now that we've finished deriving the equations of constant acceleration, we'll go ahead and do some worked examples. Right here we have a question, a body moves along a straight line from A to B with a uniform acceleration of 2 over 3 meters per second. So we are going to start straight away with summarizing this question. A body moves along a straight line from A to B. So if this is our straight line, it's moving from point A to point B. And in this straight line from point A to B, it's moving with a uniform acceleration. So the acceleration of this body is 2 thirds meters per second. Uh, of course, acceleration is meters per second squared. So meters per second squared. The time this thing is taking is 12 seconds. So the time taken here is 12 seconds. The velocity at B is 25 meters per second. So the final velocity, because it starts from A to go to B. So the velocity at A is what we shall be calling our initial velocity. It's not given in the question. The final velocity at B, which we shall call capital V, is... 25 meters per second find the velocity at a so we are being required to find the initial velocity at a so to find the velocity at a we shall use the first equation of motion v is equal to u plus at 
we have our final velocity as 25 meters per second so 25 is going to be equal to the initial velocity u which we are looking for which is u plus the acceleration which is 2 over 3 times the time taken from a to b which is 12 seconds and definitely when we make u the subject of the formula right there we shall end up with our answer as 17 meters per second that's our initial velocity and that's part a answered now part b of the question requires us to find the distance a b when it's moving from a to b what is the distance so to find the distance moved from point a to point b we are going to use v squared is equal to this is part b v squared is equal to u squared plus 2 a s we'll use that equation of that formula so our final velocity v here is 25 so this is going to become 25 squared is going to be the initial 17 squared plus 2 times acceleration now we have our acceleration as 2 over 3 meters per second so times 2 over 3 times the distance now it is the distance we are looking for the distance of mb so the distance we shall leave it as s so of course this when we make s the subject of the formula this is going to end up in 25 squared minus 17 squared we have shifted that 17 to come this way is going to be equal to here we remain with 2 times 2 is 4 over 3 times s now definitely this is going to result into when we make s the subject of the formula this is going to become 25 squared minus 17 squared divide all that by 4 times 3 and definitely now our value of s the distance between a and b is going to end up being 252 meters now this is when we've used this now remember we have up to five equations of motion so it means that you can as well use any other as long as you see it will work for you so part b can also be done in an alternative way we've used this equation we can also use this equation to get the distance s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared now the initial velocity u is 17 we got it here so it's going to be 17 times the time the time taken to move from here to here is 12 times 12 plus a half times the acceleration the acceleration is 2 over 3 2 over 3 times time squared nine time is still 12 squared and when we add all this up you still end up with 252 meters 252 just the same as this so with part b you can use this or you can use that formula either way you will still be able to get the same answer a cyclist travels downhill while accelerating uniformly at one and a half or 1.5 meters per second squared if the initial velocity at the top is that find how far it travels in eight seconds again to summarize this question he's accelerating at this so meaning that the acceleration there is one and a half meters per second squared which is the same as saying 3 over 2 meters per second squared that's the acceleration if the initial velocity at the top is that so meaning initial velocity is 3 meters per second per, per, per second then find how far he travels in 8 seconds so they want you to find the distance he travels when the time is 8 seconds so how far he travels in 8 seconds so now from our equations of motion what we can use here they want us to find the value of s so if we use s is equal to ut plus a half a t squared so we want the value of s so that's going to be u our initial velocity is 3 times time which is 8 plus a half times our acceleration is 3 over 2 times time squared our value of t is 8 so it is 8 squared and therefore our when we sum all this up we end up with 72 meters so it means that in eight seconds this guy uh, the cyclist will be have will have traveled 72 meters and that's our answer part b 
So how far does he travel? Again, they're asking you, how far does he travel? So they're asking for distance. How far does he travel before reaching a velocity of 7 meters per second? So what is the value of S? When the final velocity, V, is 7 meters per second. So how far does he is going to travel? How far does he travel to reach this velocity, the final velocity? Remember all this till uh, his initial velocity, according to the question, is 3 meters per second. So his initial velocity will still be 3 meters per second. And uh, of course, he'll still be accelerating at the same level of 3 over 2 meters per second squared. That is according to the question. Now, uh, of course, that he won't take the same time to reach this. So now still here to get our value of S, we shall use V squared is equal to Q squared plus 2 a s that's going to be now our final velocity the one is seven squared is going to be initial velocity which is three squared plus two times the acceleration which is three over two times the value of s we are looking for which is that so making s the subject of the formula here s is going to become this is seven squared this goes that way it becomes minus three squared that is uh these two cancels with that two so all this is going to be divided by 3. So our value of S here becomes 40, because this is 49, minus 3 squared, which is 9. Divide that by 3, we get you 40. Divide that by 3. And so our value of S is 13.33 meters. So this is the distance he travels. That is how far he travels before reaching the velocity of 7 meters per second. Now, a body moves along a straight line uniformly, increasing in velocity from 2 meters to 18 meters. So, we are looking at a body. This is the body. It is moving, let's say it's moving from point A to point B. But they're telling us that it is, it's moving in a straight line, uniformly increasing in velocity from 2 meters per second. So, meaning that at this point, it is initial velocity, where it starts from, is going to be 2 meters per second. And it moves from that velocity to that velocity. So meaning that its final velocity V is going to be equal to 18 meters per second. And it is moving in a time interval of 10 seconds. So meaning that the time it's going to take is 10 seconds. There will be being required to find the acceleration and the distance traveled. So here we are supposed to find the acceleration and the distance traveled. So again, from our equations of motion to find the acceleration we can just go on with the first equation of motion to answer to find the acceleration we know that v is equal to u plus 80 what is v our final velocity is 18 is going to be initial velocity u which is 2 plus our acceleration which is a times the time which is 10 seconds and then we shall end up having when we're making it a subject of the formula this 2 comes this side, it becomes 18, minus 2 is going to be equal to a times 10, which is 10a. Uh, divide both sides by 10, by 10. So definitely this goes with that. You have uh, your acceleration as 1.6. So therefore, acceleration is 1.6 meters per second. That's the acceleration according to the answer. 1.6 meters per second. Now, after finding our acceleration, we can now go ahead and find the distance traveled. And of course, the distance traveled, which is S, this is part A. So to answer part B, the distance traveled S is going to give us B equal to UT plus a half AT squared. Now, our initial velocity U is 2 meters per second. So it is 2 times our value of T, which is 10, which is 10 plus a half times our acceleration, which we got here as 1.6, times time squared, our value of t is 10. 10 squared is 100. So to get our value of s here, when we put all this, sum this all up, we will get 100 meters. And that is our distance traveled from a to b. So a train starts from rest and accelerates uniformly at 1.5 meters per second until it attains that speed. 
a speed of 30 meters per second find the distance the train travels during the motion and then the time taken so now so now the question says that a train starts from rest now when they say that a train is starting from rest it means that its initial velocity u is equal to zero because it's starting from rest and it accelerates uniformly at 1.5 meters per second so it means that its acceleration here is 1.5 meters per second squared until it attains a speed of 30 meters per second so it accelerates until it attains a speed that's now this is the final velocity so it attains a final velocity v of 30 meters per second find the distance the train travels during the motion so you're required to find the distance the train travels during the motion and the time taken so you also need to find the time taken so to find our value of s we can use the third one v squared is equal to u squared plus 2as our value of v in this case is going to be 30 so it's going to be 30 squared is going to be equal to u squared our value of u is 0 so it's always 0 squared plus 2 times acceleration which is 1.5 times s that is s with it what we're looking for so 30 squared which is 900 is going to be 0 squared which is 0 plus 2 times 1.5 which is 3 s divide both sides by 3 so our value of s is going to end up having 300 meters so the distance the the, the train travels during the motion is uh, 300 meters that's what we've got so now to find the time taken so still to find the time taken we are going to use one of the equations of motion one that is appropriate so to find the time taken we shall say s is equal to u plus v over 2 multiply that by t we know our s is 300 so 300 is going to be equal to initial velocity which is 0 plus final velocity v which is 30 divide that by 2 and all this is multiplied by t so that is going to give us 30 over 2 because 0 plus 30 is 30 so 30 over 2 is 15 so it's 15 t giving us 300 divide that by 15 divide that by 15 that goes with that by 15 once by 15 is twice 0 so the time taken here is 20 seconds so that's the time taken for the train to travel so you can as well try out that number on your screen uh, the a cheetah can accelerate from rest to 30 meters per second in a distance of 25 meters find the acceleration i expect that the acceleration you'll be able to get is 18 meters per second squared you could try it out in this video i'm going to explain the concept of retardation we're going to plot a graph that is going to represent retardation the other word for retardation is negative acceleration or called it call it deceleration let's take a case in point for example a body starts moving its initial velocity at moving is 10 meters per second then it moves for two seconds and after two seconds its its, its final velocity is two meters per second it started from 10 meters per second to 2 meters per second it would mean that its graph would look like this so it means that 10 is its initial it started from here then it moved from 10 after two seconds of movement its final velocity is 2 so its final velocity is right there 2 meters per second so that's the graph it moved from 10 to 2 so if you have to look at that graph this graph will give us a negative slope by definition we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity when the rate of change of velocity is increasing it means that the velocity time graph is going to give you a positive gradient but if the rate of change of velocity is reducing it means that you're going to have a retardation or you're going to have deceleration and this since this is going to give us a negative slope it means that it is negative acceleration to get this acceleration we know that by definition that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity the rate of change of velocity means that you're going to look at the initial velocity here which is 10 minus the final velocity which is 2 divide that by the time the initial time you stopped for you the initial time was uh, 0 
minus the final time was 2. And 10 minus 2 is definitely 8. You divide that by negative 2 and you end up with 8 divided by negative 2 is negative 4. Negative 4 meters per second squared is the acceleration. Now, of course, here we are having 8. The acceleration, this is the rate of change of velocity. Initial velocity minus final velocity gives us 8 in terms of meters per second. So it's meters per second. Divide that by 2. 2 is in time is in seconds. Divide that by 2 seconds. So meters per second divide that by second gives us meters per second squared and this is the unit for acceleration now this negative value the negative acceleration is signifying retardation it is signifying that the rate of change of velocity with time is reducing we have a stone it slides across a horizontal sheet of ice in a straight line we're going to summarize this question with a diagram we first summarize it diagrammatically then we solve it so the question says we have a stone it slides across the horizontal sheet of ice so let's look at this as a horizontal sheet of ice and it passes point A. We are having here point A with a velocity of 14 meters per second. So it means that at this point, the velocity there is 14 meters per second. Let's call this our initial velocity because it starts from point A. It passes point A with a velocity of 14 meters per second. We shall call it our initial point. And then point B, 2.5 seconds later. So meaning that it's going to pass point B. But from point A to point B, the question is telling us that it's going to pass there 2.5 seconds later. 2.5 seconds. So meaning that the time taken to move from A to B is 2.5 seconds later. Assuming uniform retardation. So meaning that they are telling us that with the velocity here, by the time it reached at B, it reduced. Meaning that the rate of change of velocity was reducing as the body was moving from A to B. So assuming that the uniform, the retardation was uniform and the distance AB was 30, so meaning that our distance S, denoted by S, is 30 meters from A to B, they're asking us to find Roman 1, the retardation. So we are going to, so we have the distance S, we have the time, we have the initial velocity U, so we, from our equations of constant acceleration, we shall choose an equation that is going to help, uh, that, that satisfies all these to give us our value of A. And since the body is retarding, we definitely expect our value of A to be negative. So we shall pick on the one of, that shows displacement, the displacement equation. S is going to be equal to UT plus a half AT squared. And we know that our value of displacement S is 30 meters, so we have 30 meters is going to be equal to initial velocity, which is 14, times the time it takes 2.5 seconds to move from here to that point B, which is 2.5, plus a half times the acceleration, it is what we are looking for, times T squared. Now, uh, the, the, the time is definitely times 2.5 squared. So when we make A the subject of the formula, we shall end up with our value of acceleration being negative 1.6 meters per second squared. Now this negative simply signifies that the body is undergoing a retardation or a deceleration. And so it means that our answer, we shall conclude by saying that the body retards at a rate of 1.6 meters per second squared so we'll go ahead and do roman 2 they want us to find the velocity at b so we do not know the velocity at b so we'll go ahead and calculate the velocity at b still we're going to use one of our equations of motion to find the velocity at b the velocity at b in this case will be we shall use the velocity at b vb v is going to be equal to we can use v squared is equal to u squared plus 2 a s this is part B we are answering. So this is going to become, our initial velocity is 14 meters per second, so it's 14 meters per second plus 2 times acceleration. Now, our acceleration here is actually, it has a negative value. Remember, we got our acceleration as negative 1.6, so it means that in our value of A here in our calculation, we have to respect that negative and put it there. It's negative 1.6 because it's actually a retardation, negative 1.6 
2 times acceleration times s. Our value of s, which is the distance, is 30 meters times 30 meters. So it's 14 squared plus 2 times that times 30 meters. So definitely when you get this, you'll end up with 100. When you find the square root on both sides, you'll end up with your velocity as 10. So our velocity here is 10 meters per second. That question is asking us, how long after passing it does the stone come to rest? So remember this, this stone, when it started from here, it moved on from A at an initial velocity of 14 meters per second. As it, kept, as it kept moving, it reached point B and the velocity we got at B was 10 meters per second. Now for it to come to rest, it means that it is supposed to continue until its velocity is zero. So it means that when they ask us for how long after passing it does the stone come to rest, they're actually asking us to find the time it's going to take for it to move from point A at that velocity up to a certain point when the velocity is zero. So it means that we are simply trying to find the value of time when the initial velocity is 14 and the final velocity is zero. Because it is when the final velocity is zero that the stone eventually comes to rest. So in our write-up, we shall assume, so we are trying to find a certain point, let's call it point C, and at this point, the velocity is supposed to be zero, the final velocity. So we need to find the value of time. How long after passing A does, does the stone come to rest? So it comes to rest when the final velocity is B. So to calculate that also, we shall simply come and say V is equal to U plus acceleration times time. And so it, it means this is part C. So meaning to f the final velocity here is zero, is going to be equal to the initial velocity. Our initial velocity in this case is 14 meters per second. So it is 14 meters per quick second plus our acceleration, which is still, it's still decelerating at a rate of 1.6 times time. So we find the value of T. So this is going to mean when 14 comes here, it becomes negative 14, is going to give us negative 1.6 T. So after passing point A, the stone is going to travel for 8.75 seconds until it comes to rest. And it comes to rest when its final velocity is zero. Start with a few further examples relating to motion in a straight line. And specifically, we'll be dealing with motion that is having constant acceleration. We have a question here, and as usual, we have to first summarize our question diagrammatically so that we're able to have an overview of the question before we begin answering it. So in this question we're having, it goes that a particle is projected away from the origin O with an initial velocity of 0 0.25 meters per second. So we are having a particle, let's say if this is our origin, it is projected from this point with an initial velocity U of 0 0.25 meters per second. The particle travels in a straight line and it accelerates at 1.5 meters per second. So meaning its acceleration right there is 1.5 meters per second squared. Find part A, how far the particle is from O after 3 seconds. So we are required to find, let's say it has been moving from here, after here it moved for first second, 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 then the third second. So when the time is 3, what is the distance? They are asking how far is the particle? So what is the distance when the particle is? Three seconds away. So of course here from our equations of motion or of constant acceleration, those equations we derived earlier, we shall pick one of them that is suitable to help us get the answer. One that is having T, A, U and is required and S as well. So from that we will know that um, we shall pick on this one. S is equal to U, T plus a half at squared. We know that our initial velocity u is 0 0.25, so it's going to be 0 0.25 meters per second. Multiply that by the time. So the time taken to, the, the question wants us to find how far after three seconds from time. So it's times three plus, that's going to be times a half, times the acceleration, in this case, which is 1.5 meters per second squared. Multiply that by, time squared, which is 3 squared, we need to find the S. And of course, there are our value, the distance, when you sum it all that up, 
it's going to be 7.5 meters. So that's our answer to part A. So part B, they're asking us to find the distance traveled by the particle during the fourth second after projection. So it means that the particle has been moving from here for the uh, for four seconds, but in the fourth second. Now there's a difference if they said find the distance traveled by the particle after four seconds, then that is different from saying the distance traveled by the particle during the fourth second. So here they want us to find the particle during the fourth second, not after the four, four seconds. So if we were being, so le, le, let's try and withdraw. So we'll try and redraw this. If I may redraw, if I may redraw this, this is like this. That's the straight line. It's beginning with an initial velocity of 0 0.25. That is meters per second. And it is having an acceleration. It's moving with an acceleration 1.5 meters per second. So if it is moving on and on and on up to three up to the fourth second, it means that at right here the value the the, the, the time here is zero. So it moves. That's the first second. That's the second second. That's the third second, and that's the fourth second. What I'm trying to say here is simple. That at this point, the time there is zero. Here the time is one. After one second, this is time two. After two seconds, after three seconds, that is after four seconds. And of course, as it's moving after all these times, when the time is one, two, three, four, the distance covered is also corresponding. So this is the distance covered after zero seconds at the beginning. Of course, there's no distance covered. This is the dis I mean the displacement after one second, the displacement of the distance after two seconds. This is the displacement after three seconds, and this is the displacement after four seconds. So if we are to find, when they ask us to find how much has been traveled, uh, the distance traveled by the particle during the fourth second, it means that from zero to one, this is the distance covered in the first second. This is the distance covered in the second second. This is the distance covered in the third second, and this is the distance covered in the fourth second. So it means that for us to find the distance covered during the fourth second, which is running from this point to that point, it means that we can get the whole distance covered from the beginning. We can get the whole distance covered after four seconds. Then we get the distance covered after three seconds. Then when we subtract the two, we're able to get the distance covered in the fourth second. If if I'm to make that clearer using different colors, it means that we're going to first get the distance covered after four seconds. The distance from there after four seconds. Then afterwards, I will calculate and get the distance covered after three seconds. It's still from the beginning after three seconds right there. Then when we get this whole distance, subtract that distance, we're able to get the remaining part. And the remaining part is the distance covered in the in the fourth second and that's what we want so it means for us to be able to get the distance covered in the fourth second like the question is requiring us to do the formula is very simple we shall call that let's call that distance uh, s so to get the distance covered let's call it s prime so the distance covered in the fourth second is going to be equal to the distance covered after four seconds which is s4 minus the distance covered after three seconds which is s Three. So now, right now, we need to find S4. What is S4? Meaning that S4 is going to be equal to ut plus a half a t squared. What is the initial velocity here? For, for, for the particle to cover up to the fourth seconds, uh, initial velocity is 0 0.25. So 0 0.25 times the time. The time is four seconds plus a half times the acceleration which is 1.5 multiply that by time squared the time is still 4 and of course our s4 is going to be so now we get s3 
Now, of course, we were able to get S3 from our previous question. Our previous question was asking us to find how far the particle is from O after 3 seconds. So it means that we already know the distance it traveled after 3 seconds from our previous working O from part A. And part A of that question, which is this here, when we were calculating for the distance traveled after 3 seconds, we got 7.5 meters. So it means that our value of S3 is 7.5 meters. So it means for us to be able to get our answer right here, we are going to simply subtract. That the distance covered in the fourth second, which is S prime, is going to be equal to S4. Now we got our S4 as 13 meters, so it's going to be 13 meters minus our value of S3, which is 7.5. And when we get 13 minus 7.5, we are able to get 5.5. So 5.5 meters simply mark, mean that's the answer. That's the distance traveled by the particle during the fourth second. Had the question asked us to find the distance traveled by the particle after four seconds, then it would mean that we are this would be the answer because this S4 here means that these 13 meters were covered from the beginning up to the fourth second. A car is being driven along a road at a steady speed of 25 meters per second. So if it is starting from here, it is starting traveling along a, a straight road. It is being driven along a straight road at a steady speed of 25 meters per second. So it means that it is its beginning, its initial speed is 25 meters per second as it's moving. When the driver suddenly notices that there is a fallen tree blocking the road 65 meters ahead, the driver immediately applies the brakes. So it means as this driver was moving, he notices 65 meters ahead that there is a tree and then he applies the brake. So it, meaning, it means that from the time he applies the brakes, the distance between him and the tree is 65 meters because the question says that when the driver suddenly notices that there is a fallen tree blocking the road, 65 meters ahead, he immediately applies the brakes. So it means, let's assume according to our diagram, at this point, this is when the driver notices that there is a certain tree here ahead of the road. So when he notices that there is a tree, he immediately applies the brakes from this point. So when he applies the brakes from this point, it means that the distance remaining from this point to there, this distance remaining is actually... 65 meters before he reaches the tree that's according to the question so we continue so the driver immediately applies the brakes giving the car a constant retardation of five meters per second so meaning as when he applies the brakes the retardation which is the value of a is five meters now the retardation means it is negative acceleration so it means the retardation or the deceleration is simply negative five meters per second that's the constant relation gives so they're asking us to find how far in front of the car does the car come to rest now let's take note of this this question is having two kinds of motion okay it is all straight line motion but we have straight line motion with constant velocity then we have straight line motion with constant acceleration or deceleration in this case, we are having that the first portion of the journey when this car was moving, it was moving at a constant velocity of 25 meters per second. And from our theory, we know that when the motion is constant, when a vehicle is moving at constant velocity, its acceleration is zero. So it means that when we look at our constant acceleration formula, all the, 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 the common three formula, our acceleration is zero when the motion is moving at constant velocity. Then from here, the velocity that was previously constant starts varying until it drops to zero because he applies the brakes. So when he applies the brakes, now the acceleration ceases to be zero and now the acceleration starts, it becomes constant now. The, the acceleration is now reducing at a rate of negative five, at, at a rate of five meters per second. It's reducing, it's retarding. So it means the velocity from this point to that point is no longer constant. So it means that because the acceleration, I mean the velocity between this point and that point is varying, 
it means that the equations that are going to work in between this portion are the constant acceleration formula or equations which we derived much earlier in the earlier videos. So let's get started with the question. Roman 1. How far in front of the car does the car come to rest? It means that when this guy applied the brakes here and he started coming, in between here, he eventually comes to rest before he hits the tree. So the question is how far in front, uh, sorry, right there, oh, there's a, it's how far in front of the tree. So it means that when the guy applies his brakes somewhere in between here, he eventually comes to rest in front of the tree. So let's say he applies his brakes up to like a certain point there. And it is at that point that he eventually comes to rest. The question is asking, when he comes to rest, what is this remaining distance? How far in front of the tree does the car come to rest? How far in front of the tree? So it means that we're supposed to find the distance he covered. We know the distance from this point to that point, it's 65 meters. So we need to find the distance from that point when he applies the brakes up to that point when he comes to rest. So we know that while he was moving here, he was moving at an initial speed of 25 meters per second. So it means that even while he was at this point, since he was moving at a constant speed, still at this point, it's his initial velocity here is going to be 25 meters per second. But then when he starts applying the brakes, his velocity drops from 25 up to a certain point here. His final velocity at that point is zero. So we need to find the distance here covered when his initial speed is that, his final speed is zero, and his retardation is 5 meters per second. So we'll get straight with the working. So to get that distance from here to there, the distance he covered, we shall say, uh, v squared is going to be giving us u squared plus 2as. We are interested in getting the value of s. So v squared, which is the final velocity, which is 0 squared, is going to be equal to u squared, which is 25 squared uh, plus 2 times acceleration is negative 5 because it's retarding. Negative 5 times s. S is what we are looking for. Now, of course, when we make S the subject of the formula here, we are able to find our value of S as 62.5 meters. So, meaning that the distance covered from here to there is 62.5 meters. The distance he covers until he comes to rest. But the question is asking that how far in front of the tree does the car come to rest? It means we are interested in this remaining distance in front of the tree. How far does he come to rest? So it means that the answer here is going to be 65 meters minus 62.5 to be able to get the distance in front of the tree for us to be able to answer Roman 1. So it means that it's going to be 65 meters minus 62.5 meters. And definitely our answer is going to be 2.5 meters. So it means that for Roman 1, uh, the distance, he, uh, how far does he come to rest in front of the tree? The answer is 2.5 meters. Now let's get Roman 2. Roman 2 says that if the driver had not immediately reacted and the brakes were applied one second later, with what speed would the car have to hit the tree? So now would, with what speed will the car have to hit the tree? So Again, as he was moving, he notices that the tree is 65 meters ahead. He applies the brakes. When he applies the brakes, he's able to stop somewhere before he hits the tree. Now here the question is telling us that what if he had not applied the brakes immediately? So when he does, and then he delays by just one second. The question here implies that when he doesn't do so, he's definitely going to hit the tree. So with what velocity does he hit the tree? So it means that since we know that before he had noticed it 65 meters ahead, so meaning that from this point had he, if he is to delay just one second later, it means the certain distance is supposed to cover. So we need to first find the distance he covers in that one second when he delays to apply the brakes. 
so that we're able to subtract off that distance and we're able to deal with our new diagram. Let, just for clarity, I'll redraw this diagram. So initially he moves at a constant speed of 25 meters per second as he's moving at that constant speed. He reaches at that point and he realizes that there is a tree ahead. And the tree at that point was 65 meters ahead. So he starts retarding. Uh, the retardation is at neg it's negative 5 meters per second. He retards at 5 meters per second, or called it the acceleration, is 5 meters per second. But now here, Roman 2, the question is telling us that if the driver had not immediately re reacted to the brakes and uh, non instead uh, responds or activates the brakes one second later, with what, speed, with what speed will he have to hit the tree? So it means that he gets to hit the tree. But he hits the tree because he delays to activate the brake by just one second. So the question is, in what distance does, is he able to travel in that one second? Now remember that when he was beginning his journey, he was moving at a constant speed of 25 meters per second. Since he was moving at this constant speed of 25 meters per second, it means the acceleration from this point to that point until he applies the brakes is zero because at constant velocity the acceleration is zero so to be able to find that extra distance he covers in that one second when he delays to apply the brakes that distance we shall denote as s is going to be the speed which is u times the time the speed with which is moving is 25 meters per second multiply that by the time which is one second so it means that he moves 25 meters so it means that right here he moves an extra distance of 25 meters so when he moves that extra distance of 25 meters remember that this the speed the tree was initially he is able to notice the tree when it was 65 meters ahead in the second instance when he delays by one second from the point he notices the tree he delays by one second to apply the brake he moves an extra 25 meters so the question is by the at the new point when he applies the brakes which is after he has now traveled for those 25 meters at this new point how much distance is there does he have to hit the tree of course to get the distance remaining to hit the tree is going to be 65 meters minus 25 to remain with 40. So meaning that from here to here you're having 40 meters remaining for him to hit the tree. And of course while he is at that point, when he applies the brakes, the initial velocity is still the same. The initial velocity at that point u is going to still be 25 meters per second. And the final velocity with which he hits the tree, final v, is what we are looking for. And the acceleration is still going to be negative 5 meters per second. So our task here is to find the final velocity with which he hits the tree. So to get the final velocity v, still we are going to say v squared is going to be equal to u squared plus 2as. That's going to be u squared, which is 25 squared plus 2 times acceleration, which is negative 5. It's negative, meaning it's retarding. Uh, times the distance. The distance is 40 meters to hit the tree and the velocity with which he hits the tree is 50 meters per second. So that A motor car starting from rest, again we are going to summarize our question in a diagrammatic way. A, di a motor car that is starting from rest and moving with uniform acceleration goes 9.5 meters in the 10th second after starting. So if we are to illustrate that diagrammatically, we have a motor car starting from rest, meaning that its initial velocity is zero and it is going after one second, after two seconds, and then it continues into the ninth second, then into the tenth second. So it's telling us that it goes 9.5 meters in the tenth second. So it means that between the ninth between there and there, this is the tenth, because from this is the first, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth, the ninth. Then the tenth second, it goes 9.5 
meters in the tenth second after starting find the acceleration of the car so they want you to find the acceleration of the car and the distance covered during five seconds from start so after finding the acceleration they want you to find the distance covered after five seconds s subscript five again here the technique we are going to use is the fact that we know that it is moving 9.5 meters in the tenth second so it means we are going to get the expression for the distance covered after 10 seconds minus the distance covered after 9 seconds so that we are able to get to equate it to 9.5 and within there we are able to get our value of acceleration A. So it means in this case we are going to get the distance covered after 10 seconds S10 is going to be equal to UT plus a half a t squared but we know that u initial velocity is zero so zero times t in this whole thing is zero plus a half so it's going to be a half times acceleration which you do not know which you're looking for times time squared t is 10 so it is 10 squared so you'll find that your value of s10 or the distance covered after 10 seconds we'll call it the displacement after 10 seconds is going to be a hundred a over two so that is s10 so now let's go ahead and find the distance covered after nine seconds the expression for s9 is going to be equal to still again ut plus a half a t squared that's going to be initial velocity zero here is zero so it's zero times t this whole time would die plus a half so we have a half times the acceleration the acceleration in this case it's going to be not known yet times the time squared which is nine squared which is 81 so we shall end up with 81 a divide all that by two that is s nine so we know that to get the distance covered after 10 seconds minus the distance covered after 9 seconds, we will be able to get the 9.5 meters. Or to make it more clearer for some of us who may not have gotten it yet, we have gotten the expression for how many, how much have we moved after 10 seconds? We've moved from here. That's S10. Then the distance covered after 9 seconds is that. From here up to there this is s9 like that so to be able to get nine the 9.5 means we are going to get the distance covered after 10 seconds minus the distance covered after nine seconds to be able to get the 9.5 so it means in simple terms this simply means that s10 minus s9 is giving is equal to 9.5 and from that expression we're able to get a value of acceleration so s10 is 100 a over 2 minus s9 which is 81 a over 2 giving us 9.5 of course when we work it out we shall end up with our acce we shall end up with our acceleration being 1 so that's the acceleration we get so the other part of the question is asking us to find the distance covered during five seconds from start. The distance covered during the five seconds from start. It is different from saying the distance covered during the fifth second. Here they want the distance covered during five seconds from start. So it means to get the distance covered five seconds from start, we shall say the distance covered during five seconds from start is going to be equal to ut still plus a half a t squared this is going to be initial velocity which is still zero times t so this whole term is zero plus a half which is a half times the acceleration we got the acceleration as one meters per second times time which is five seconds which is five squared so we shall end up with 25 <music>
with uniform acceleration the particle passes through points a so let's call this point a point b and then point c in that order at time t is equal to 0 2 and 5 respectively so at time is equal to t is equal to 0 t is equal to 2 and t when t is 5 so when the time is 0 when the time is 2 seconds and the time is 5 seconds respectively so if bc is 30 meters from here to here it's 30 meters if bc is 30 meters and the speed at b is 7 meters per second so the speed at b let's call it um, final velocity v is 7 meters per second find the acceleration of the particle and its speed when at a so they want you to find the initial velocity here and also they that is the speed at a of course the speed at a is the initial velocity so they want you to find the initial velocity and also they want you to find the acceleration of the particle so they also want you to find the acceleration of the particle now already in some part of our information we've been told that the between b and c the uh, the, the object covers 30 meters so we can use this to find our value of a the acceleration we know that we can we are going to get the expression for distance from a to c subtract the expression for distance from a to b because sc minus sb gives us 30 meters so let's look at the distance covered after at c we shall call it the distance covered at c sc is going to be given by of course we shall be using ut plus a half a t squared we know that the distance covered after traveling up to c initial velocity here we do not know this so we shall call it u times the time times value of t, t at c is 5 so u times 5 plus a half times the acceleration which we do not know because we don't know it times t squared times 5 squared of course here we are going to end up with 5 u plus a half times this is 5 squared is going to be 25 a so a half times 25 a so this is like 25 a divided by 2 so this is distance covered after move reaching point c so let's also get the distance covered at b s b distance covered at b is going to be equal to still ut plus a half a t squared uh, the initial velocity of course it's not known it's going to be u times t the t at b is 2 so it's 2 u times 2 plus a half times the acceleration which we still do not know times time squared the time is 2 at the point b time is 2 so it means that it's 2 squared and so we shall end up with our sb as 2u plus 2a so we have our expression for sb we have our expression for sc and we know that sc minus sb is giving us 30 meters so we shall say that the distance covered after c minus the distance covered after b gives us 30 meters so sc is going to be 5u plus 25 over 2 is 12.5a minus sb which is 2u plus 2a is going to give us 30 meters and so we are going to get an expression in u and a so this becomes 5u minus 2u is 3u we have 3u plus 10.5a is equal to 30 meters so it means that we need to look for another equation from our information that is going to help us to get the values of a and u so that we solve the two simultaneously looking at uh, our question the other information that we can take advantage of that can help us get the second equation is that we have this distance a b and in this distance a b we are having the initial velocity not given and then we have the final velocity here seven so if we use the first equation of motion 
v is equal to u plus at we know that our final velocity is 7 our initial velocity is not known which we are supposed to be getting and also our acceleration is not known we are also supposed to be getting it this simply means that we'll be getting a second equation that is having these two unknowns and we shall be able to solve those two equations simultaneously so that we are able to get the value of a which is the acceleration and they also the value of u which is the initial velocity or the velocity at point a so we'll go ahead and find that second equation so getting ours we know that v is going to be equal to u plus at and we know that our final velocity if you are to consider motion from a to b only it means if the the, 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 the the particles traveling from a to b b would be the final velocity which is seven is going to be equal to the initial velocity u which is the velocity at a which we do not know plus the acceleration which we do not know times a and then uh, multiply that by the time it takes to move from a to b the time is two seconds which is times two so we end up with seven being equal to u plus 2a so we have our second equation our first equation was this one so it means that from these two equations we, we solve them simultaneously and get the value of a of course we substitute we make you the subject of the formula here and we substitute the u into there so if we make you the subject of the formula here you'll find that u will be equal to 7 minus 2a so we substitute for this value of u and put it right here and when we put it right there we're able to get the value of u and then finally the value of a so right here if we are to put it in there it will become 3 times u now the value of u is this one here so 3 times u which is 7 minus 2a plus 10.5a is going to be equal to 30 so definitely this is 21 minus 6a plus 10.5a giving us 30 um, negative 6 plus 10.5a is going to give us 4.5a is going to give us 30 minus 21 giving us 9 then our value of a definitely there is 2 meters per second squared so after getting our value of a as 2 meters per second squared we can go ahead and substitute for the value of a here so that we're able to get u so when we substitute our value of a there to get the value of u we shall end up getting our value of u being equal to 7 minus 2a 7 minus 2a a is 2 so 2 times 2 giving us 7 minus 4 and we have our value of u as 3 meters per second so in so doing we are able to have we will have finished solving the whole question the question is asking us to find the acceleration of the particle and its speed when at a so we are able to find the acceleration of the particle which was 2 meters per second squared and its speed at a which so happens to be the value of u the initial speed which was u which we got at 3 meters per second Today we get to look at motion under gravity and motion under gravity is still straight line motion it means that even as we are dealing with motion under gravity we are still going to use the three equations of motion or call them the equations of constant acceleration the three that are very common of course in our previous videos we derived five but there are three that are very commonly used now it is still going to be motion in a straight line the only difference here is that our acceleration is acceleration due to gravity now when dealing with motion under the influence of gravity it is presumed or we shall assume that we are not experiencing any kind of air resistance and so because we are not experiencing any air resistance that is in our presumption it would simply mean that the object is falling freely under the influence of gravity now gravity varies from place to place depending on where you are on the earth uh, in some places gravity is 10 meters per second in others it is 9.8 now for the purposes for this video we shall take our value of gravity or the acceleration due to gravity to be 9.8 meters per second 
Now, just like we had earlier derived our equations of motion or our uniform acceleration formula, the, those very equations are going to be used here when we are dealing with motion under gravity and definitely the value of A is going to become negative G. Now, where does this negative come from? We all know that because we are on the earth, we are attracted. There is a force that pulls us towards the earth, which we call the gravitational force. This gravitational force acts towards the center of the earth. Now, if meaning when you are to jump from a plane in the air and you're coming downwards, as you're coming, your speed will be increasing because the force you're coming closer to the force of gravity. So you'll be coming downwards with a very high speed but if you are to throw a stone into the air it means you're throwing this stone away from the force of gravity it means as you're throwing the stone upwards from the ground as it moves up it will be reducing its speed it reduces its speed until it reaches a certain point where its speed will be zero then it will come back down to the earth what does that mean it means that as you are throwing it up, the speed keeps reducing. It means that the stone is moving up against the force of gravity. The force of gravity in this case is acting in the opposite direction to the direction of the stone that you're throwing up. That is why as it is moving up, its speed keeps reducing, its velocity keeps reducing. So because its velocity keeps reducing, it means that when you are throwing a body and it is moving vertically upwards, away from the earth, it's going upwards, its acceleration due to gravity will be negative g. Why? Because as you're throwing it upwards, it is decelerating. Its speed is reducing. Its rate of change of velocity is reducing as it's going up. Yet when, it is, when you throw something, drop it from up, up, then you drop it down, it will move very fast. When you're dealing with straight line motion under the influence of gravity, when the body is moving towards up, it's moving away from gravity or it is working in opposition to the force of gravity that is pulling it down. And so its acceleration due to gravity will always be negative G. And as a result, the equations of motion of, will be like this. And of course, if the body is moving vertically downwards towards this earth, towards the center of gravity, it would mean that the value of g will be positive. And so it means that these equations will remain the way they are, only that the place of acceleration is actually g, which is meaning acceleration g to gravity. So we are going to do some worked examples to illustrate how these work. So we have a question right here. A brick is thrown vertically downwards from the top of a building and it has an initial velocity of 1.5 meters per second. If the height of the building is that, find the velocity with which the brick hits the ground. As usual, we first summarize the question diagrammatically. A brick is thrown vertically downwards. So it's on top of a building, right? So we are having this being our top, our building. And right on top here, we are having a brick. It's thrown vertically downwards from the top of a building and it has an initial velocity of that. So our initial velocity here is 1.5 meters per second. If the height of the building is not that, so meaning that as it's moving down, the height of this building is 19.2 over 7. Find the velocity with which the brick hits the ground. Now, of course, as it's moving downwards, it's moving towards the earth. So it means that the acceleration is G. It's positive gravity. So it means the velocity with which it hits the ground definitely is going to be equal to V squared is going to be equal to U squared plus 2AS. So the final velocity with which it hits the ground is what we are looking for. We shall call that V squared is going to be equal to U squared, which is 1.5 squared plus 2 times acceleration. We said in this video we shall acceleration due to gravity will be 9.8, so it's going to be 9.8 times the displacement. Now the displacement as it's moving from up down on top of the building, the height of the building is 19, 2 over 7 
meters so it means that it's going to be 19 2 over 7 meters so our definitely our answer will be 19.5 meters per second that is the velocity with which it hits the ground so part b we are having the they're asking us to find the time taken for the brick to fall so to get the time taken for the brick to fall using the first equation of motion v is going to be equal to u plus a t and that's going to be our initial speed is going to be 1.5 plus our acceleration which is the gravity which is 9.8 times the time which we're looking for is going to be our final velocity of course our final velocity we already got it as 19.5 so it's 19.5 when we make t the subject of the formula we shall get our value of time as 1.84 seconds now we'll take this a notch higher a ball is thrown vertically upwards with a velocity of 14.7 meters per second from a platform 19.6 meters above the ground level then find the time taken for the ball to reach the ground and the velocity of the ball when it hits the ground now again we will summarize our questionnaire diagram so a ball is thrown vertically upwards with a velocity of that and it's on a platform 19.6 meters above the ground so this is the platform we're talking about right here this platform is 19.6 meters above the ground and this ball is thrown vertically upward so it will go up then come back down this is our ground so a ball is thrown vertically upward with a velocity of 14.7 meters per second so it means it's going upward with the velocity of 14.7 meters per second from a platform that is 19.6 meters above the ground this is the ground then they're asking us to find the time taken for the ball to reach the ground so it means that the ball goes up then it comes back down to the ground how much how long is it going to take for it to move from here up to there now let's try and first of all analyze the parameters before we answer this question let's analyze the parameters in this question as far as motion in a straight line is concerned we have the displacement s we have the initial velocity we have the final velocity we have the acceleration and we have the time summarized as so that now the displacement when we are talking when we are dealing with motion under the influence of gravity displacement is a vector quantity initial and final velocity these are also velocity they are both vector quantities acceleration is a vector quantity it's only time that is not that is a scalar quantity so what does that mean because we are dealing with vector quantities we has we are supposed to take into consideration their direction as well all these are vector quantities and by definition we know that a vector quantity is a physical quantity that has both magnitude and direction so it means that as far as this motion is concerned you will find that this motion is first moving upwards then when it goes reaches maximum height it changes its direction and it moves downwards so it means that all that is going to change it's going to affect the signs or the the signs of these quantities displacement is the distance in a specified direction now it means that if this is where you threw your ball from this is your initial platform it means that when you move upwards our displacement will be positive when you move downwards our displacement will be negative if we are talking about velocity initial velocity and final velocity if you're moving upwards it means the velocity will be positive if you're moving downwards it will mean the positive the velocity is negative if we're talking about acceleration now when it comes to acceleration if you're moving downwards it is positive and it is positive because the force of acceleration the gravitational force of attraction acts downwards so the acceleration is positive downwards but when you move upwards it means you're moving against the force of attraction or against gravity so acceleration will be negative as you're moving upwards so it means that in numbers like this where uh, the direction of the motion is changing we will have to respect the signs on these parameters now speaking of acceleration because this thing is moving upwards the acceleration is going to be negative all through how 
this is the explanation let's consider let's say the body the ball is moving from that point to that point so it's moving up it means that here our initial velocity is a positive here our final velocity is also positive as it's moving from here to there moving upwards so what is the accel the sign on the acceleration as it moves up it means that our acceleration here a which is actually g is going to be equal to final velocity v minus initial velocity u over the time so final velocity which is positive minus initial velocity which is also positive over time and you'll find that the acceleration you're going to get here is going to be negative why remember as you're throwing a stone upwards the higher it goes it goes with its speed reducing its velocity keeps reducing until it reaches zero when the velocity reaches zero then it comes back down so it means this initial velocity if it is 10 the final velocity will be less than 10 because it as it's moving up its speed is reducing and so because it's it's its speed is less it means that here our final v is a small number minus our u which is a bigger number so definitely the answer we are going to be getting here will be a negative answer divided by time so our acceleration will be negative and it that's why we say that when acceleration is moving upwards for uh, particles that are under the influence of gravity the acceleration is negative g for a particle moving up now let's look at it when it's coming back down remember it has been moving up positive velocity positive velocity then it's coming down let's take a case in point we're having that point and that point as it's moving back downwards we're having the final velocity here and the initial velocity there we are considering this motion that it's coming starting from here coming back to down here our initial velocity here is negative and our final velocity here is also negative these are negatives because now they are moving downwards the direction has flipped so what is our the sign of our acceleration we know that acceleration in that case is going to be equal to our final velocity which is negative v minus our initial velocity which is negative u divide that by t and of course this negative and negative becomes positive will remain with negative v plus u over t and we shall end up with our acceleration is it going to be a positive or a negative now let's analyze this as this particle is moving from here and it's coming back down yes the velocities will be negative because now the motion is moving downwards but remember as it's coming towards acceleration its speed increases because now it is being pulled by this force of gravity previously as it was moving up its speed was reducing because the gravity was pulling it downwards so its speed was reducing until it became zero then it starts moving down of course as it moves down the higher it the, the lower it moves the higher the speed the speed keeps increasing so it means that this value of v here is going to be higher than that u that value the, ve the velocity here is going to be less than the velocity here so it means that here you're going to have a negative velocity which is higher plus a velocity which is low now let's say this was negative 30 this is 30 meters per second if it's that if you dropped it off here at 10 uh, at 10 meters per second it's going to keep increasing to 30 and so forth so you're having a negative number that is so large and you're adding it to a small positive number a small value of u it means that if this value of v was 30 it's negative 30 plus 10 if this was 10 i'm giving an example so it means that our overall answer here whatever the figures will be will always be giving you a negative so that is why even as it is coming down our acceleration due to gravity will always be a negative g so that is why in this calculation as we are trying to find the time taken for the ball to start from here to go up to down here our value of g the gravity will be negative because it is negative as you're moving up and even as you're coming back down so with g that is how it is our s the displacement will be positive upwards and negative downwards our velocities 
if you're moving upwards they're positive if you're coming downwards they're negative and this is our point of reference now let's go ahead and start answering this question the question is saying that the time taken for the ball to reach the ground so again we shall be using our equations of motion is going to be equal to ut plus a half a t squared now our initial velocity is 14.7 so you have 14.7 now initial velocity is positive it's moving downward so it's positive 14.7 times t um, plus a half times acceleration now our acceleration is going to be negative 9.8 i already explained where the negative is coming from in the first case it's even going again as gravity a negative 9.8 times t squared is going to be s now our value of s remember they're telling us that what time is it at what time the time taken for the ball to reach the ground so for this ball to move from here to go up and reach the ground it will be its displacement will be negative 19.6 because the displacement will be below this point of reference where it started from so our displacement here will be negative 19.6 and definitely when we work out the values of t here you're going to end up with a quadratic equation in t t squared minus 3t minus 4 is equal to 0 we end up with our value of t being either 4 or t being either negative 1 so uh we shall take value of 4 as our answer we can't have negative 1 as our answer because we can't we do not have negative time now looking at part b of the question we are requiring us to find the velocity of the ball when it hits the ground so when it moves it hits the ground definitely as it's hitting the ground its velocity is negative so using v is it going to equal to u plus a t so the final velocity definitely is the negative v because it's moving downwards as it's hitting so negative v is going to be equal to the initial velocity our initial velocity is a positive so it's 14.7 so it's going to be 14.7 um the acceleration remember is negative 9.8 so it's going to be minus 9.8 times the time now the time taken for it to reach the ground is 4 according to our previous question so it's times 4 so we go ahead and calculate uh, we, we are going to end up with our negative uh, our value of v giving us negative 24.5 meters per second now of course our negative this negative here simply shows signifies that the ball is acting downwards so the velocity with which it hits the ground is 24 so a particle is projected upwards with a velocity of 34.3 meters per second find how long after projection the particle is at a height of 49 meters above the point of projection for the first time and for the second time so we'll summarize our question again the particle is projected upwards with a velocity of 34.3 meters per second so our initial velocity here is 34.3 meters per second so find how long after projection should they ask you they're asking for the time how long after projection the particle is at a height of 49 meters above the point of projection so this is the point of projection so uh, let's say this is 49 meters this is the 49 meters above the point of projection this is the our point of projection so after how long so it means that as this particle goes up and comes down you realize that as it's moving up it will be 49 meters above the point of projection for the first time then it will move reach maximum height and probably come back as it's coming back down again it will be 49 meters above the point of projection the second time so the question is asking us to find the time when it is there the first time and when it is there the second time as simple as that so again our value of g since it's moving upwards our value of acceleration is definitely negative g so we shall go ahead and say our displacement s is going to be equal to ut plus a half a t squared the displacement in question here is 49 meters so 49 meters is going to be equal to initial velocity u which is 34.3 times the time 
that is plus a half a our acceleration is negative 9.8 times t squared when you rearrange this equation you're going to end up with a quadratic equation and that quadratic equation so solving that quadratic equation gives you t minus 5 the roots are 5 and 2 so the values of time is going to be equal to 5 or t is going to be equal to 2 so to answer the question it simply means that as this particle was moving upwards the first time it will be 49 meters above the point of projection will be 2 seconds so that answers part a then the second time it will be 49 meters above the point of projection is 5 seconds and that answers part b today we get to look at how we represent straight line motion graphically now there are basically two things that we will be looking at as far as graphical representation of straight line motion is concerned we will look at velocity time graphs and while we are representing this motion on a velocity time graph we all know that the area under the velocity time graph represents the distance covered by that particle that is moving for example when you look at this if we want to find the distance covered by this particle as it's moving from this point probably up to right there we are simply going to get the area under this this trapezium right here plus this area or oh, we'll look at the area of this whole thing secondly when we are dealing with graphical representation of motion in a straight line we all know that the velocity time graph produces a graph whose gradient gives us the acceleration so if you have to look at for example point a b if you are to get the gradient of point a b we have this particle for example it's moving from point a to point b at point a this is the initial velocity it moves to point b a new velocity we shall call the final velocity this point a to point b is moving from a point from a, from point zero zero times zero seconds to a certain time t seconds so to get the acceleration means we are getting the gradient of that line and therefore the gradient which so happens to be the acceleration is going to be equal to the change in y which is v minus u over the change in x which is t minus o and we end up with v minus u over t giving us the acceleration so we'll get straight into a few examples each of the following velocity time graphs are for a body which starts from rest, accelerates uniformly at a particular velocity, maintains that velocity for a period of time, and then retards to rest. So in each case, find the acceleration during the initial part of the motion, the retardation during the final part of the motion, and the total distance traveled by the body during the motion. So these are the graphs we are talking about right here. So they're asking us, in, the, in these three graphs, in each case, find the acceleration during the initial part of the motion so now this is the initial part we're looking at this graph the initial part of the motion is this one looking at this graph this is the initial part of the motion now the acceleration during the initial part of the motion simply means that we are going to find the gradient of that part the gradient of that initial part of the motion so it means in this case we are simply going to say that the gradient of o as the motion is moving from this point to that point the, which is the acceleration is going to be changed in y which is final velocity minus initial velocity which is 6 minus 0 divide that by the change in x which is the final time 3 minus the initial time which is 0 so we end up with 6 over 3 giving us 2 meters per second squared that's the acceleration here and uh, the, the acceleration for this part, it's still we're going to get it. This, we can get it the same way, or we can get it using a different way. We can use the first equation of motion. If you look at the first part, the, an object moves from here up to there. It means that as far as that portion, the first portion of the equation, the, the motion is concerned, zero is the initial velocity. Our initial velocity, u, is equal to zero. Our final velocity is is equal to 4 and it means that uh, our time taken to move from here to here is 1 second so we can use the first equation of motion which is v is equal to u plus a t that's going to be our final velocity here is 4 is going to be equal to initial velocity u which is 0 plus acceleration which we are looking for times time 
which is 1. So we mean that we will find that our acceleration here is 4. So acceleration is 4. So this same method here, we can still employ it even here. It's the same thing. That you look at the first portion of the motion. This is 0 is your initial velocity. 6 is your final velocity, V. Then you're looking for A. Then the time T is 3 seconds. And you're able to get your acceleration as 2 meters per second. So uh, Roman 2, they're asking us to find the retardation during the final part of the motion. Now, if you look at this graph, the final part of the motion is that. Even this one, the final part of the motion is this one. Now, it is retardation. Remember, retardation is negative acceleration. So it means you are going to move to employ the same method. We are simply going to find the gradient of that line to be able to find the retardation. Again, we can use the first equation of motion because if you look at this final part of the motion from here to here, the initial velocity there is 6. So it means that our initial velocity u is 6. Our final velocity is zero so our final velocity is equal to zero and it's moving from seven to nine the time taken from seven to nine is nine minus seven is two seconds so the time taken there is two seconds so to find our retardation which is negative acceleration we shall simply say v is going to be equal to u plus a t what is our value of v zero is going to be equal to initial velocity which is six plus a which we are looking for times time which is two so you'll find that our this is 2a 2a plus 6 is equal to 0 when 6 comes this way you remain with negative 6 is equal to 2a divide both sides by 2 and you will end up with your value of a as negative 3 so the negative definitely signifies that the acceleration is retarding it's retardation actually that's what the negative signifies. So just like we are just doing this, it's the same method we will be employing here to find the retardation. Or you can just find the gradient of this line to find the retardation. Either way, you will be able to get the answer. Then Roman 3, the total distance traveled by the body during motion. Now we say that the total distance traveled by a body for a velocity time graph, the area under the graph is what is representing the total distance traveled. So in this case, we will be finding the, dist the area of this. This is a trapezium. So to find the total distance traveled in that first portion, we shall simply say total distance is the area under the graph is going to be the, 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 the formula is a half h into a plus b. That's going to be equal to a half times the height. Now the height is 6 times 6 into a. Our value of a is 7 minus 3 is 4 plus our value of b is 0 and 9 it's 9 so we shall end up with a half times 6 which is 3 times 9 times plus 4 13 so for our first graph it's going to be 39 meters. That's the distance traveled. It's going to be with the same formula that we shall use to find the total distance covered in the second graph. It is very simple. It's going to be a half h into a plus b because this is the area under a trapezium. Now our height definitely is 4. Our value of a is that distance from there up to there which is 4 minus 1 which is 3 because the distance from here is 3. Then our value of B is that line there, which is 7. So when we substitute in, we are able to get the distance covered by the motion in the second graph. In a nutshell, this question is requiring us to express the value of T as T is equal to 9x over U. So they're asking us to make a sketch of the velocity time graph of this information for the motion and show that capital T is equal to 9x over u so let's get started two stations a and b are a distance six x meters apart a train starts from rest at a so it means that if it's going to start from rest at point a it means that its initial velocity is zero that's what we mean when a body starts from rest its velocity is zero 
So it starts from rest at A and accelerates uniformly to a speed u meters per second. So from right here, if it's accelerating uniformly, remember by definition from our theory, that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So it means that if an object is accelerating uniformly, it means that the rate of change of velocity is uniform. It means the rate at which velocity is changing is uniform. So it means that it accelerates uniformly up to a certain speed, u meters per second. So it means it's going to accelerate up to a certain speed, u. Of course, when we are talking about speed, speed is just a scalar quantity. Velocity is just speed within a specified direction. So its speed is u meters per second, covering a distance of x meters. So it means that it moves from here to here. The area under this graph represents the distance covered. And so the distance covered is x meters. So the distance covered here is x meters. So the question continues. The train then maintains this speed until it has traveled a further 3x meters. So it's going to maintain this speed of u for some time. But while it's maintaining this speed, it, it travels 3x meters, a further 3x meters. So it means that the area under the graph from the point, it, meant it started maintaining this speed to where it stops. Here the speed maintained here is 3x meters. So it means the area under that portion of the graph is 3x meters. Then the question continues to say it then retards uniformly to rest at B. Then so meaning right here it's going to retard to rest. When it's retarding to rest it means that it retards to a point where its velocity is 0. So it means that it's going to retard back to u is equal to 0. It retards to velocity is equal to 0. It retards to rest. And the question says that it retards uniformly to rest at B. So it's going to retard uniformly to rest at point B. So uh, make a sketch of the velocity time graph for the motion. We've already done that. This is the velocity time graph representing the motion. And show that if capital T is the time taken for the train to travel from A to B, so meaning that this was where it started from, this is where it ended. So it means that capital T is this. Capital T is this right here. From here to here is capital T. Because according to the question, they are telling us that if capital T is the time taken for the train to travel from A to B, then capital T is equal to 9x over U. So if capital T is from A, this point to that point, then we are supposed to show that capital T is equal to 9x over U. So we are going to use the information we have to find, to show that capital T is going to be equal to 9x over u. So let's start answering the question. The area under a velocity time graph represents the distance covered by that particle that we are dealing with. Now if we may go back to our question a little bit, we are being told that these two stations A and B are 6x meters apart. If they are 6x meters apart, it means that the total area under this whole region is 6x meaning that if we get the area of this portion plus the area of that portion plus the area of this portion we are destined to get 6x because that is the total distance covered from this point to that point so it means that if we are to say the total distance covered between a and b is going to be equal to the total area under this we are able to try and get to this expression so we'll begin by saying, so the total distance covered is equivalent to the area under the velocity time graph. So in this case, the total distance covered from A to B, according to the question, is 6x meters. So 6x meters is going to be equal to the area under this. Now the area, you, if you may look at this, this is a trapezium. And the area of a trapezium is given by a half times the height into A plus B. Now if you have to look at this, the height we are looking at here is this. This is our value of H, which is U. Then our value of A here will be this. And our value of B is that. 
So to substitute, we shall go on and say that that's going to be 6x is going to be equal to a half times h, which is u into a. Now we need to get our value of a. To get our value of a, we can we know that this the area under this portion is equivalent to 3x meters, the distance covered under this portion when the car was maintaining this velocity. And we know that the area under this portion is going to be length times width because it is a rectangle. If I may do some side work here, we know that the total area A is going to be equal to length times width. Now the total area under this portion, this middle portion is 3x, is going to be equal to the length, the length, which is the so-called A, times the width, the width is so happens to be U. So meaning that when we make you the subject of the formula there, we shall end up with our value of A as 3x over U. So it means that we come here and put our value of A is actually 3x over U. So this is going to become 3x divided that by U, add that to B. Now our value of B, this whole length, so happens to be capital T, so it's plus capital T. So meaning that in this expression, we shall go ahead and find, make T the subject of the formula and see if it arrives to this, to this expression. So this is continuing, we shall say 6x is going to be equal to, this times that is 3xu, divide that by 2u plus a half u times capital T is a half u capital T. Of course that you will go with that. So we try and bring this that way, it becomes 6x minus 3x over 2 is going to give us ut over 2. Divide that by 1, LCM here is 2, 2 divided by 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 12x, minus 2 divided by 2 is 1, 1 times 3 is 3x, is going to give us ut over 2. 12 minus 3 is going to give us 9x over 2 is going to be equal to u, capital T, over 2. Making t the subject of the formula means we multiply 2 on both sides here and divide through by u. You shall end up with capital T being equal to 2 times 9x over 2 and divide that by u. So that 2 goes with that. You remain with capital T here giving us 9x over u. Now 9x over u we so happens to be what we have proved. Using the information that had been given to us in the question we've been able to prove that capital T is going to be 9x over u. So that answers the this question. In this video, we are going to look at how we solve problems that involve straight line motion using the numerical approach. Now, we use the numerical approach when the parameters in the question have been given at different time intervals. Sometimes you can be given a question. They can tell you that probably a particle starts from rest or it starts from a certain point and after a certain time t, it has moved a certain distance, s1. Then a certain time t2, it has moved a certain distance, s2. So you'll find that the distance moved here is probably not the same as this, or if they, they are the same, probably the velocity, the acceleration between the, the, the velocity between this point and that point is not the same as the velocity between this point and that point. That kind of thing, we are going to look at examples to look at how it comes out. Now, the whole point here is that if the information has been given to you in that kind of format, let's say you're having after T1, a particle covers a certain distance, S1, maybe after T3, a certain distance, S3 has been covered. If you've been given the information in that kind of format, it means that you are going to analyze each and every interval. You're going to look at the question in terms of interval by interval for you to be able to get the acceleration because right here much as the information has been given to you interval by interval here we are looking at constant acceleration so it means that the acceleration is going to be the same so it means that our main issue here is to be able to find the acceleration 
if we are to be able to find the acceleration throughout this whole motion, the straight line motion, then we can get the initial velocity, the final velocity, and so on and so forth. So we will be able to, in this case, we shall be analyzing interval by interval. Let's say we want to find the acceleration. So we look at the initial interval from T0 to T1, the initial interval. We will get the, velo the average velocity in this initial interval and the average time. Then we shall get to the next interval. We'll get the velocity between this interval and the time. And then now that we have the velocity in this interval, we have the velocity in this interval, and we have the average time in this interval and the average time in that interval, then we can use these two intervals to get the acceleration of this whole straight line motion. Because since we have the velocity and the time, we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity with time. So it's a matter of saying that the velocity of this interval minus the velocity of this interval, divide that by the time, average time here minus average time there, we are able to get the acceleration. Let's go through this step by step. Let's assume this is what we've been given and we've been told we want to find the acceleration for a particle that's moving from this point to that point. So how do we go about this? We are going to consider interval by interval. So so let's look at the first interval from T0 to T1. From when, it, when, the, when the particle started moving from this point, it moved up to, after T1, it covered a certain distance, S1. So to get the average velocity here, of course, we know that velocity by definition is the rate of change of displacement. So we get the final displacement here minus initial, S1 minus S0, divide that by the time, T1 minus T0 so that we are able to get the velocity in this interval. And of course, the average time in between here is going to be T0 plus T1 divided by 2 to be able to get the average time in this interval. So we've got the information for that interval. So it means you're going to go ahead and get to the second interval, T2, T1, T2. So in this second interval, we are still going to do the same. We want to get the velocity in between this interval because the velocities are not the same. And by definition, from our theory, we know that the rate of change of displacement equals velocity. So meaning that to get our velocity in the second interval, it's going to be S2 minus S1, divide that by T2 minus T1. I mean, the rate of change of displacement divided by, by the time in that interval for us to be able to get the velocity in this interval. After getting the velocity in that interval, then we get the average time here. So it's going to be T2 plus T1, divide that by 2 to get the average time in that interval. Just like there we did in the previous interval, we got the average time. Now, from these two intervals, now that we have got the velocity here, the average velocity and the average time here, we have the average velocity and the average time in this interval. So getting acceleration, by definition, we know that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So it means that this is going to be this minus that. Velocity here minus velocity there. Divide that by time here minus time there. And this is how we'll be doing it. That acceleration is going to be equal to the initial velocity. I mean, acceleration is going to be the average velocity in the second interval, which is V prime prime minus average velocity in the first interval which is v prime divide that by the average time in the second interval which is t prime prime minus the average time in the first interval which is t prime and we're able to get the acceleration that we are requiring or that we are looking for for us to be able to get the initial velocity we are going to concentrate on interval by interval when we are using this formula v is equal to u plus at if we want to get the initial velocity and we have decided to concentrate on the first interval it's going to mean that our value of v, the final velocity, will be v prime, which so happens to be the average velocity gotten here, and our value of time in this equation will be t prime, which is the average time gotten in this first interval. If we are to use the second interval, it means in our substitutions of v is equal to u plus at, our value of v will be v prime prime, which so happens to be the average velocity in the second interval, and our value of t that so happens to be t prime prime which so happens to be the average time we got in the second interval so we'll do a rough example a train approaching a station runs two successive half kilometers in 16 and 20 seconds respectively assuming the retardation to be uniform 
find the initial speed of the motion of the train and the further distance the train runs before it actually gets to stop. So here's our summary. That's the straight line motion of the train. We are being there to, of the train. A train is approaching a station. It is going to run two successive half kilometers in 16 and 20 seconds. So it's going to run two successive half kilometers and we know now half kilometer has got 500 meters so we have the first half a kilometer which is 500 meters we shall use 500 meters we are converting the kilometers to meters so this is half kilometer of course and that is half kilometer so a train approaching a station runs two successive half kilometers so this is the first half kilometer and this is the second half kilometer and this in meters is 500 meters and this is also 500 meters so two successive half kilometers in 16 and 20 seconds respectively it means that in the first portion it was 16 seconds in the second portion it was a train for 20 seconds assuming the retardation to be uniform so it means that the retardation which is negative acceleration is uniform from this point all through so find the initial speed of the train. So let's say this is our point A, that's our point B, our point C. They want us to find the initial speed here. And then, so of course for us to be able to get our initial speed, we need to first be able to know the acceleration because for us to be able to get the value of U means, or the initial speed, means we are going to use V is equal to U plus AT. So we need to first find the value of A. Then when you get the value of A, which is the acceleration, then we are able to get the value of U using specific intervals as we will be able to choose. So we'll start off just like in our earlier illustration, we shall go interval by interval. So now between A and B, what is our, uh, we know that velocity is change we call it V prime. Our V prime is going to be the displacement. Let's call this, um, if this is displacement at zero, let's call it S naught or S at A. Then this is the displacement at point B. Then this is the displacement at point C. Then the time taken, let's call this the time taken at point A time at point A, this is the time taken at point B, this is the time taken at point C. So to get uh, the displacement, the, the, the velocity, initial velocity here is going to be equal to the change in displacement which is SB minus SA. Now SB minus SA so happens to be 500 meters according to the question so it's going to be, let's first write that down, SB minus SA, divide that by time the time in that interval is tb minus ta and the time in this case it's going to be so it means that our initial velocity sb minus sa is already spelled out here as 500 kilometers i mean 500 meters divide that by the time between here and there tb minus ta is 16 seconds the time taken is 16 seconds and of course uh, 500 meters divide that by 16 seconds we shall end up with our average velocity being equal to um, 125 divide that by 4 this is in meters per second so what about our average time between here of course our average time is going to be equal to the time at this spot plus the time at that spot divided by 2 that is tb plus ta divide that by 2 and we shall end up with of course um, the t time at A, this is when it just started, so it is 0 plus the time at B. The time at B is definitely 16 seconds, because it takes 16 seconds to reach this point, so it's up plus 16, divide that by 2, and we shall end up with 8 seconds as our average time. So that is it for the first interval. So we'll go on and look at the motion between the second interval between B and C, and we are going to do the exact same thing. We get the average velocity in the second interval and the average time. So looking at the second interval, our average speed or our average velocity, we shall call V prime prime, is going to be equal to SC minus SB, divide that by time 
TC minus TB. That's going to be equal to, now the, the, the displacement between B and C, SC minus SB is already 500 meters. So it's going to be 500 meters. Divide that by the change, the time here, the change in time here is definitely 20 seconds. And of course here, our velocity V prime prime will be 25 meters per second. So we'll go ahead and find the average time in this slot. The average time we shall call T prime prime is going to be equal to S, uh, the time, take, time at B plus time taken to reach C, divide that by two. So the time to taken to reach B is 16 seconds. Add that to the time taken to reach C, it means from A up to C is going to be 16 plus 20, which is 36. Divide that by two. And definitely when we, our answer there for average time is going to be 26 seconds. So we've already finished getting our average speed and average time for the second interval. So after getting those two, we can go ahead and now get our acceleration because the question requires us to find the initial speed of the train, but we can't get the initial speed when we do not have the acceleration. So first, we'll get the acceleration. So the acceleration in this case will be equal to, is going to be the rate of change of velocity. So it's going to be V prime prime minus V prime, divide that by T prime prime minus T prime. And in this case, our V prime prime, we got as 25 minus V prime. Our V prime is one to five over four. Divide all that by T prime prime, which is 26. Divide that minus T prime, which so happens to be eight seconds. And our answer for that, we'll get our acceleration as negative 25 over 72 meters per second squared. That's our value for acceleration. Now that we have our value for acceleration, we can go ahead and find our value of u, the initial velocity, which is required of us to find in the question. But now to get our value of u, you're either going to concentrate on the first interval or the second interval. If we are to concentrate on the first interval, that is between a and b, and we are going to use v is equal to u plus at, what is going to be our answer? v is equal to u plus at. If I'm to look at it from A to B, for me to be able to get the value of U, it means my V is supposed to be V prime is going to be equal to U plus the acceleration and my T is supposed to be T prime. So my V prime from what I got, V prime is one to five over four right here. So it's going to be one 125 over 4 is going to be equal to the initial velocity u which I'm looking for the velocity at point a plus now the acceleration is what I got earlier my value of a is negative 25 over 72 so it's negative 25 divided by that by 72 times time t prime now the t prime I got earlier as my t prime is eight seconds actually this is t prime it's eight seconds so when we make you the subject of the formula here we shall end up with one two two five divide that by 36 and this is in meters per second now this is if you're to convert this to decimal point it is approximately 34.0278 meters a second that is the initial velocity or the velocity at point a and that makes us to get the initial speed or the initial velocity at point a which is that we've already answered that solve this using our first portion now we can still get the same answer 
using the second part of the motion and in this case if you are to use the same formula v is equal to u plus 80 v is equal to u plus 80 but in this case we say that we want to find our value of u when we are using b to c that is from b to c it means that our value of v in this case here is going to be v prime prime because we are using the second spot is going to be equal to u the one you're looking for plus the acceleration which is the same all through times t prime prime the average time in the second slot so it means that the v prime prime of average velocity from here is going to be what we got our v prime prime we got 25 meters per second so it's going to be 25 meters per second is going to be equal to the u we are looking for plus our acceleration it is still going to be the same negative 25 over 72 times t prime prime now our t prime prime from our earlier calculations we got it as 26 seconds so it's going to be 26 seconds and of course our value of u there is going to be 34 point zero two seven eight meters per second just like the way we got this one so you can either get the value of u either using the first portion or the second portion of the motion we go ahead and find the second part of the equation they're asking us to find the further distance the train runs before stopping now we realize that this train has been retarding so this it means this train has been retarding so if this train has been retarding, we are, we are being tried to find the further distance the train runs before stopping. So it has been running from this point. It has reached up to that point. Now, how much further is it going to run for it to reach at a point where its velocity is zero? Because when velocity is zero, the final velocity is zero. That is when it stops. So what is this further distance we are looking for this so it means that it's we just need to find the whole of this distance so we have the initial velocity we have the final velocity being zero then we have the the deceleration so we need to simply find the whole distance then when we get the whole distance then we subtract it from this distance so that we're able to get the further distance it has to travel before it comes to rest looking at our diagram here we have the whole of this from here, our initial velocity u from our earlier calculations, when the thing started moving, we got it as um, 1, 2, 2, 5 over 36 meters per second. From our diagram, we're able to see that the getting to this v is equal to 0. To, to get this extra distance, we have our initial velocity there, which is 1, 2, 2, 5 divided by 36. Of course, this is equivalent to or approximately 34. 0 0.0278 but I prefer to use the fraction form of this so that I do not tamper with the accuracy of my calculation that's the initial velocity we already got our retardation as negative 25 over 72 this is in meters per second squared this is our initial velocity retardation so we know that our final velocity when it comes to rest has to be zero so our final velocity is zero and our task here is to find the whole distance so that we are able to get the further distance it travels before it comes to rest so we need to get our value of s so if we are to use our third equation of uniform acceleration motion which is v squared is going to be equal to u squared plus 2 a s r v squared Final velocity v is 0, so it's going to be 0 squared. It's going to be initial velocity u squared, which is this. I'll plug in the, the fraction to preserve my accuracy plus 2 times the acceleration, which is minus 25 over 72 times the distance traveled, which is s. Of course, yeah, when I make S the subject of a formula, I will end up with my value of S as 1667.36 meters. So it means that it is 1667.36 meters moved from this point to that point, for the, to the point when it comes to rest. So the further distance covered means it's this whole distance minus the 1000 meters. So the further distance covered...
said before your screen is another number that you can try out and see if you'll be able to get the required answers. For Roman 1, the acceleration, I expect to get 0 0.27 meters per second. And, and Roman 2, the velocity with which it passes A, that is the initial velocity, I expect you to get approximately 0 0.67 meters per second. And this brings... This brings us to the end of this video. Thanks for watching. Feel free to check out other excellent videos on the channel and don't forget to subscribe. For Kisembo Academy, this is Anwar Brangakuramia helping you manifest excellence.